This is a serious story that's been circulating. And already the Internet is up in arms over whether or not they believe it. With many people who are pro-Israel saying, how could you not? The reporting coming out that babies had been beheaded by Hamas. And it sounds so extreme. It is, I mean this quite in a literal sense, it is unbelievable. But uh, Fox News is reporting it. I-24 initially reported it. And there are many people who are skeptical of this um, because of uh, past testimony, the Nier testimony in particular, uh, back during, uh, I think it was in the early 90s, when a young woman claimed that Saddam's forces were taking babies out of incubators. So we're going to talk about the news that's coming out. And obviously, this is a, a very, very complex issue that is extremely heated. But of course, it is now on the forefront as U.S. special forces are offering assistance over the hostages who have been taken by Hamas, which Biden says many may be American citizens. Of course, there was a carrier group dispatched and fears that this could escalate into a more serious conflict. And if we're seeing conflict now escalating to the, the point of U.S. or other, or other countries mobilizing, you know, maybe we're, we're, we're at the point where we might say World War Three. They've been saying that about Ukraine for some time now. But when we get, you know, conflict at this level in various regions, if China then moves on Taiwan, things get really, really bad. So we'll talk about that, plus uh, uh, several of the stories. But for the most part, I mean, this is the news that's dominating right now. Uh, before we get started, my friends, head over to castbrew.com. You like coffee? I know you do. We got coffee. You want to buy it from us. Gas Brew Coffee is our coffee brand. And when you go to castbrew.com and purchase our coffee, you are supporting our show and Getting the best cup of coffee you'll ever have. My personal favorite is Appalachian Nights, but it's a close tie with Rise with Roberto Jr. And I'll be totally honest, Rise with Roberto Jr. sells the most, but I'm pretty sure it's just because there's a picture of the late and great Roberto Jr. on the bag. But we've got a, different, uh, a bunch of different blends and uh, varieties. We also have K-Cups, we have Ground, we have Whole Bean, and of course, the Re-Rise with Roberto Jr. Halloween special limited edition medium roast will be coming out soon. You can join the Casper Coffee Club. Uh, we're sponsoring ourselves. We're working on the coffee shop. Should be open in a couple months. I know it's delayed, delayed, delayed. But uh, if you go to Casper.com and buy from us, you are supporting the work we do. But don't forget to head over to TimCast.com. Click join us. Become a member because we're going to have a members only uncensored show coming up for you at 10 p.m. Where you as members who join our Discord server to hang out with like-minded individuals can submit questions and actually call into the show and talk to us and our guests. So smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show right now. Take that URL, post it on every platform if you really do want to help out. Joining us tonight to talk about this and a whole lot more is Max Blumenthal. How's it going? It's going good. Who are you? First of all, thank you for the malort. Yes, uh, <laughs> I cannot believe that Max came in and I said, we have water, we have, we have uh, you know, some whiskey, and you can have whatever you want. I, I, most people don't drink these days. And he went, oh, I'll have the Malort. And I was like, what? So for those that don't know, Malort is a, <laughs> it's a joke in Chicago. It is like uh, considered to be not good. We're about to, we're just about to like reveal the greatest secret right now because it's, it's dope. I mean. You it, like it? It, it? I got hooked on it. My, most of my family's from Chicago and I just got hooked on it out there. It's made out of wormwood. It's like. It's like bathtub prohibition style liquor and it's a very acquired taste. And so, yeah, I was really, it was really well, a privilege to try that. Um, I am the editor and founder of the gray zone.com. We're an independent website cause you really can't say shit anywhere outside of independent media these days. Uh, most of the people I work with, all of them can't work in media and we focus mostly on issues of empire, uh, foreign policy we try to touch the third rail say what other people say say what isn't being said um and i think our work really speaks for itself and we try to focus on reporting investigative journalism and not you know cut strident commentary we do lots of video work we do a stream every week i've written four books i've done two books on israel palestine wow um goliath and the 51 day war where i covered the is the war in Gaza in 2014, which lasted for 51 days. And I've done a documentary about that called Killing Gaza, which is free on YouTube. Um, you can find it at the Gray Zone YouTube channel. Um, I directed it. Um, Dan Cohen did a lot of filming for it. And um, we, I mean, Dan interviewed fighters from these Gaza factions about why they fight. Uh, we interviewed people who have been, who've, um, this, we showed the whole spectrum of life in the Gaza Strip under siege. And so, you know, from that experience that I've had, I am not surprised at all by what's happening right now. I'm not shocked. Um, as 
upsetting as it is to watch. I'm not shocked at all. So what you're saying is you're totally partisan. No one can trust you. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm I'm I, I I'm transparent. Yeah, and I think that's what people like is they know where you're coming from. Well, I think it'll be it'll be interesting to to uh, talk to you about. I'm it. biased, I mean, but I I mean we need if we we wouldn't have got anywhere at the gray zone if we weren't factual. Um, but I obviously have a bias, and that will come out in the next three hours. I think it'll be I think it'll be great. So uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for this yeah, be fun. Yeah, it's a, right on. We got Phil Labonte hanging out. Hello, yeah. everybody. My name is Phil Labonte. Very failed uh, musician, vocalist for all that remains, anti-communist and uh, counter-revolutionary. You guys, Ian Cross, and I've had a powerful 24 hours. I, I prayed to Jesus for the first time in my life last night. Uh, actually, no, last night uh, was the second time I prayed to Jesus. Last night I said, Jesus, what should I do? And he said, go surfing. <laughs> nice. And I was like, ah, but I knew what he meant. It was like, get healthy, go out on the water, get away from all the, the radiation, like get pe find peace with yourself. Ian got love bombed. Yeah, and then the comments are like thousands of people like, finally you understand what it sounds like, what his voice sounds like. And it's like, I get it. I, I appreciate it. Yes, but I also prayed to Muhammad. And I said, oh, what? Man. I said, please help me. And he said, Ni it was this visualization of a knife. Like his anger was palpable. So I started listening to the Quran to understand how he thinks so that maybe I can have a more clear prayer union with him. Well, you know, quite powerful. take your journey. Man. And also, it's interesting that uh, in Gaza, Palestine, they had the 51-day war because I want to make Palestine the 51st American state. I think, Whoa! <laughs> I think this is the solution. We're just, we're just here to offend everybody with yeah, the next I, I want right. to make life good, <laughs> man. good for those people. We, we, I want to make it a high-tech place where people can thrive and communicate with their neighbors and live in peace. We can have trade unions all disavow. working. And it can be well, no, Islamic look, look. in nature. It'll be wonderful. I think I think Ian's probably just being a little a little hyperbolic I am to desperate. shock people. But Absolutely looking I think for it's a way. fair to say... No matter who you are, we want peace in the Middle East. We want peace in the world. But uh, we'll, we'll get into it. We got Serge here. Yeah, man. Uh, you don't pray to Muhammad, but I mean, anyways, yeah. Serge, uh, <laughs> Serge.gov today, filling in for Serge.com. Uh, at least the way I'm dressed. <laughs> you can tell by the, the, nice, the nice do. Anyways, yeah, let's get into it, Tim. All right, here's the big story. This is from Fox News. They say at least 40 babies, <coughs> some beheaded found by is, uh, Israel soldiers in Hamas-attacked village. IDF Major General Itai Varov described the scene in Kfar Aza as a massacre. Israel's military has discovered unspeakable horrors in an Israeli community that was attacked by Hamas on Saturday, including dozens of dead babies, some with their heads chopped off, Israeli media reported. According to local Israeli outlet I-24 News, IDF soldiers moved into Kfar Aza, one of the community's Hamas terrorists invaded early Saturday morning and discovered about 40 dead babies, some decapitated. Now, they say it several times before the article gets started. The IDF were removing the bodies of victims found in the area when they found the children's remains. Israeli soldiers are attempting to use bones to identify the victims, according to the report. It's not a war. It's not a battlefield. You see the babies, the mother, the father in their bedrooms, in their protection rooms and how the terrorists killed them. IDF Major General Itai Varuv said, describing the scene, I-24 reported, it's a massacre. Now, immediately, a lot of people brought up uh, the Nayira testimony, which is a young woman, Nayira al-Sabah, in the early 90s, in 1990, early 90s, who had stated that Saddam's forces were pulling babies out of incubators and leaving them to die. So the news is obviously shocking. And the first thing I'm just going to say as we get into this uh, subject matter is, look, man, this is such a heated issue. There are there's people uh, tweeting out photos and videos. They're saying uh, the the attacks it's pure evil. Don't support this. You, you, you've got tweets from uh, people like Ben Shapiro saying there's a big difference between Israel trying to prevent civilian deaths and Hamas targeting civilians. So obviously, this is extremely heated. That being said, I remain skeptical on stories like this. There are a lot of videos I'm seeing shared. I can't prove these videos are what people say they are. There are some videos that are easily discernible. Like, yes, there's there's paratroopers coming in. Some of these are clearly not from uh, they're not. Uh, what people will do is I'll take videos from other conflicts and then they'll caption them and put them as if it was now to shock you or whatever. Some of the videos we've seen are, are, are clear and plain as day. Uh, and and they're, I think the reporting speaks for itself. But then there are more shocking stories like this. There are videos that start right in the middle of something egregious happening that we don't know where they come from. So I just hope everybody keeps a level head to the best of their abilities. We can try and figure out what's true and what isn't. But I'm curious what uh, all of you guys think about this latest reporting, because this is look, the the idea that babies are, are beheaded is is international Cassis belly. I mean, it is the U.S. sending a strike group, a carrier group. This says we rally our allies and say these terrorist groups must be stopped. That's why I have fears about what what these stories uh, mean. I the first thing I you know heard 
or the first thing that I thought when I heard it was obviously the uh, the stories that led to the first Iraq war. Um, the, that, that's the now your testimony. Yeah. So I mean, that was the first thing I thought of, and I mean, there's plenty of actual evidence of horrible things happening when the the Palestinians actually, you know, launched the attack. I think it was like 1,500 actual fighters. They said actually went into Palestine. There's into Israel, you mean? Yeah, I'm sorry, into, into Israel. Um, there's plenty of evidence that they killed innocent people. There's plenty of evidence that they, you know, carried out what amounts to a terror attack. It's not a military operation. There's plenty of evidence. So there are videos you don't want to watch. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I don't, so I don't need to... I don't need to believe that they were cutting off babies' heads to condemn the attack on Israel. So, you know, I if if it turns out that it happened, I'm not shocked. I mean, I was alive when ISIS when when the 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 uh the Islamic State was in existence and the and I saw videos of them cutting off people's heads and doing terrible things. I remember 9/11, you know, that you don't need to have this particular thing to be real to be like, okay, terrorists do really horrible, horrible things with the intent of terrorizing people. I'm curious what you think, Max. Yeah, I, w I would be shocked, first of all, because Hamas is mortally opposed to ISIS and Salafi elements. They've actually battled them in the streets in Rafah before. Uh, they consider them a threat to their stability, and is Israeli intelligence actually has worked with Salafi elements in Gaza to destabilize Hamas, just as Israeli intelligence supported Hamas to destabilize the PLO when it controlled Gaza in the 1980s. So I would be shocked if they employed something like this. The only source so far on this story is one Israeli soldier uh, who's a very interesting character. We've traced his identity at the gray zone. And it comes through a state-sponsored Israeli media organization, as you pointed out, I-24, the reporter Nicole Sedek, who just went to Kafar Aza and said, I'm hearing that babies were beheaded. Right. Then the Israeli foreign ministry goes and blasts it out, 40 babies beheaded. Why? Because the U.S. bombed the crap out of ISIS in Raqqa. They, we destroyed half of the city of Raqqa, and that's what Israel wants us to do to Iran. They want us to see Hamas as ISIS and then to get involved in their regional conflicts. So they're pushing this story. The source is a Israeli soldier named Davidi Benzion, who is a settler leader. He's from one of the fanatical wings of Israeli politics. And he, uh, you know, he's a reservist. He's serving in the military. But he got in trouble earlier this year because he called for an entire Palestinian village to be wiped off the map next to his illegal settlement in the West Bank. And he's the guy go that she's interviewing as her credible witness. I don't trust it. And as you said, Israel has enough to go on right now to try to portray itself, even though it's the occupier and besieger of the Gaza Strip, according to international law, to portray itself as a victim. Why do they need to do this? It's, cause, it's because they're trying to draw the U.S. in. I agree with that, for sure. Because that, that's why everybody immediately brings up the New York testimony. What will shock Americans to the most extreme degree to justify U.S. involvement? You should break that down, though. Like the New York testimony. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can break it down. We have the Wikipedia we pulled up. Uh, false testimony given to the United States Congress, uh, Congressional Human Rights Caucus, October tenth, nineteen ninety, by a fifteen-year-old girl who was publicly identified by the time by her first name, Nayira. The testimony was widely publicized and was cited numerous times by U.S. senators and George H.W. Bush in their rationale to uh, to support Kuwait in the Gulf War. In 1992, it was revealed Nayira's uh, uh, last name was Al Sabah, and that she was the daughter of Saud Al Sabah, the Kuwaiti ambassador to the U.S. Furthermore, it was revealed that her testimony was organized as part of the Citizens for a Free Kuwait Public Relations Campaign, which was run by the American public relations firm Hill and Knowlton for the Kuwaiti government. Following this, Al Sabah's testimony has become regarded as a classic example of modern atrocity propaganda. So uh, it is it, it is false testimony. Uh, her story initially was even corroborated by Amnesty International. So this is crazy. I mean, I'm a little kid. I'm four years old when this stuff's going down. Actually, what what month was it? It was uh, October. So I was, yeah, I was, the, the I was story, four. The story was that they were stabbing babies in incubators yeah. with bayonets and throwing them on the ground so that way they could take the incubators back to Iraq from Kuwait. That was the that yeah. was the story. Like, and I mean, I was. 15 when i heard it or whatever so you know what the hell did i know but i was like oh that's so terrible and but now looking back obviously it's like it especially today with the the way that we have the ability to communicate and produce fake videos and have videos that don't have any context with them you have to be really careful you know look man 
uh, do I think it's possible that some babies were killed? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if 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 they're if they're coming into a kibbutz and they're shooting, yeah, there's crossfire. I see kids killed in Chicago, right? It's and and you're in an active conflict zone. Likely going to happen. I think it's possible that uh, uh, like the most reasonable and rational thing that could that that I would say highest probability in terms of this being truthful is that you know a couple babies died. One had its man. This is such a hor- horrible thing to say, but. So severely injured to the point of decapitation and then someone passes it along and it mon- purple monkey dishwashes itself the telephones itself into 40 babies killed beheaded and a more extreme version of the story but now it serves a political purpose so it escalates to a point where fox news is reporting it headline as though it's yeah. you know proven the challenging thing is what do you need how do you prove it what do you like what do you do if this is this, if this is true if they're not lying well, there's another purpose to it, which is to deflect from the obviously true real videos of babies being killed by Israeli airstrikes all across the Gaza Strip. When I was in Gaza in 2014, I went to Khan Yunis, which is in the southeast, uh, had been completely destroyed at its eastern edge by the Israeli military. <clears throat> and the casualties were so intense that the hospital started filling up in Khan Yunis. And I went to a small hospital and talked to the head of the hospital and he showed me photos and i've these photos are on my twitter page from the time all real he had to bring in from local shops ice cream coolers to store dead babies in because the mortuaries had run out of space and now we see israel attacking the hospital in beit hanun in the north is completely out of commission uh all of these hospitals are coming under attack so Babies are dying in the Gaza Strip. There's video right now. Jackson Hinkle just tweeted a video of a father carrying his baby out of the rubble. There's another video on the Times of Gaza, a local publication of a father putting his infant daughter to sleep for the last time. And they've completely erased these casualties. They've always been erased. And that's part of what fuels the, the violence and the ruthlessness that we see from these fighters is that they want to avenge what they call their martyrs. And that fuels what is you know referred to as the cycle of violence this is the invisibilization of them so you, you you think that some hamas fighters they they target civilians because civilians in gaza are targeted well what, or first of all let let's 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 point out another thing that's being left out of the conversation what cnn never showed this fox never showed this they targeted military bases primarily military bases like Nahal Az that are maintaining the siege of Gaza and they overwhelmed those bases and humiliated the fourth most powerful military on the planet with a blue water navy with nuclear weapons. Some of these fighters were filmed entering the bases with no shoes on. They're using homemade weapons, AK-47s, uh, paragliders, fishing boats to get in. This is not a powerful army and they humiliated them and Israelis vaunted intelligence services. So they don't want to talk about that. And yes, they went in. A lot of these kibbutzim are right next to the bases. I've been to them. Yeah, but they, they, they did like, I mean, this is a terrorist attack. They went to a music festival and started killing people. So I get what you're saying. Like they are definitely the under underdogs and stuff, but like to classify it, what, at, to what, try and point out that it's, or to make it, to legitimize it as a, as an actual military operation, I think totally glosses over the fact that they attacked civilians intentionally. They did. It, it, it was a military operation, <clears throat> and Israel is now attacking civilians intentionally. They're not targeting. Targeting Israel okay. has a doctrine of targeting civilians intentionally. It's called the Dahia Doctrine, and I can lay out what it is. But they believe that if they attack civilians and humiliate them, they will overthrow. They will eventually rise up against their government. They tested it against Hezbollah in Lebanon, and it failed. It's called, and it's and it's being used against the civilians in the Gaza Strip. They want okay, but- to lower their morale so much that they actually turn but on you're Hamas. still talking about a reta- you're talking about a retaliation right like because like i said again this initially started and and granted you you i don't know the the details about about where they if they attack the uh the military bases or whatever and, and i'm not trying to push back on that but the idea that this is just a military operation they specifically went and started killing people at the festival like, I, I mean, it, it has all of the, the it reminds me of the Bataclan in Paris. Like, well, it, it's a terror attack. The point is to, it, like, so maybe if you want to say that the Israelis are terrorists as well, fine. Like, I'm, I'm not here to defend Israel. But the idea that the initial attack was a military operation or exclusively military, uh-uh. They attacked people well, I, I, and they when, went after civilians and killed people at a, when, at a, at a when, show. When, when Max started to bring this up, I mean, 
my, my I'm, I'm not interjecting because I want to hear what you have to say about what were they targeting in terms of military targets. I don't think it makes sense for uh, Hamas to come in and just literally only target a music festival. Obviously, I think it's it, it's reasonable that they targeted a wide uh, breadth of, of things. But uh, I do agree with Phil. I mean, the problem is the one of the arguments we're hearing is that they're breaking out of an open air prison. Well, OK, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I've, I, I know people who have, are the families of those in Palestine, those who have come from Gaza and absolutely have heard these arguments. But to then see them going to music festival, like a music festival and laughing about it, you know, and, and, and grabbing people and throwing them on the ground. We, I mean, I suppose the argument is the videos are all fake or something, but there's videos of the guys walking up to cars and just shooting regular people like just in their cars who have no idea what's going on. What's that Israeli doctrine of targeting civilians called? Dahia doctrine. And they also, if you could, if you look up Israel and mowing the lawn, that's uh, yeah. a common term we, that the Israeli military uses. They that ain't just the Israeli military. Blood makes the no, grass grow, homie. No, no, but we, but I, I brought <laughs> this up before when, uh, um, I, I think I brought this up when I was on PBD on Saturday, when this all went down back when protective edge happened in 2014, I, I did not cover, uh, this stuff. My, mine was civil unrest, not civil war, not, not war, but, uh, speaking with many of the journalists who had covered the region, both in Israel and in Palestine. And these guys, I got to tell you, if you met them, you'd be like, they're, they're middle of the road, milquetoast fence sitter types. They, they refer to it as mowing the lawn. They say Israel, every couple of years will decimate parts of Gaza to reduce, you know, uh, as they described it, their military capabilities. But I'm curious what, you know, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, there's there, there, there's so many issues on the table. I mean, to the music festival, which is like the, the most, you know, grisly thing, one of the most grisly things we've seen prior to Israel leveling entire neighborhoods in Gaza City, including neighborhoods I stayed in where many people actually are not friendly to Hamas. Um, they're holding an EDM molly fueled music festival on the, the border. The drugs that, they are, that they're on are, do not matter. Like well, it doesn't matter that they're doing well, that. They're doing. Gonna, okay, sorry. okay well, it doesn't matter what drugs they're on. You're right. <laughs> what matters is they're holding a music f festival on the border of a caged in ghetto where people are, have very little water. They bathe in salt water in Gaza. I've done it. They bathe in salt water. They have two to three hours of electricity and they're doing this right there, right next to a military base. And what appears to have happened is a military base was targeted. These, this, this music festival became a target of opportunity which is yep. you know unfortunate and maybe gut-wrenching there's no way to justify it and here's what the objective of these fighters one of the main objectives which is not really discussed properly in our media and it doesn't matter if you support israel or palestine here you have to acknowledge this objective it's to get as many israeli citizens into <laughs> the hands of the authorities in gaza to negotiate because Israel is holding thousands and thousands of Palestinian captives in its prison. There is one guy named Just, Hat, Hadar Anan who died this this May after a three month three month hunger strike. So you 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 just said that you said the goal is to kidnap. The goal and is return to spur negotiations and change the strategic by kidnapping and bringing them back to Gaza. That's kidnapping. What, That's the, terrorist activity. Israel that is not fact, Israel. I have watched Israel kidnap children. From I am not saying that Israel's in right. villages. No, it's not. It's not about this is not about right or wrong. It's about not being not seeing this in a stupid emotional way. I'm not saying you're being stupid or emotional, but we are being cultivated in this country to be stupid and emotional by not trying to understand why this attack took place. Gilad Shalit was an Israeli soldier who is captured out of his tank in 2011 by fighters from Gaza, actually not affiliated with Hamas. And Israel was forced to exchange over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners, captives in the mind of Palestinians, for this one soldier. So now they have, let's say, 100 captives. They do not want them to die in Gaza because this is the only bargaining chip they've had after Palestinians have had every single diplomatic channel blocked to them. And they are even, they've even had food channels blocked to them. People, people want us to take the most emotional approach to this, they're killing civilians and stuff. I think, I think you know, that's typically my view. It's bad that they're doing that. I agree with Phil, but I do think it's absolutely uh, fair uh, to step back and say, why are they doing it? And how do they view it? And and, and to do that involves some very ruthless shit. Well, yeah. wars, kidnapping, war, yeah. ki exactly. Kidnapping civilians, which they've explicitly said they will now execute unless Israel takes specific, specific Specific actions like no more bombings, the return they said of other. Warn, they said warn before bombing because Israel's been bringing roofs down on the heads of entire families. A family of 19 was killed in, in Jabalia refugee camp. 
That's so what they said. They didn't. The but the Palestinians didn't warn the Israelis that they were coming to the festival, right? They didn't warn nope. the and, Israelis but, but, that they were coming. I don't know in. if the so, festival was the target. No, that's fine. You, you, you know, it, they, they, they weren't get, warning. They weren't warning people. They weren't warning the Israelis that they were coming. So I mean, look, you're yeah. pointing out that the Israelis do warn the Palestinians, like, "Hey, this location, we are going to blow it up." Yeah, like I uh, do. I, I uh, correct, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, uh, the Al Qassam brigades warned Ashkelon that they were going to be firing a bunch of rockets. Ashkelon, I think yes, they did. They, they should have um, warned. These first. areas are now mostly evacuated. But uh, you know, I've done interviews in Gaza, just like we're doing now, although maybe without the malort. And <laughs> I went up in Palestine Tower to do an interview in the middle of Gaza City. I walked up nine flights of stairs because the electricity was off. Everything's running on generators there. Um, and did some interviews. A few years later, Israel drops a warning flare on the roof of that media tower where all the journalists work and operate. I've also edited videos from there with some really nice Palestinian journalists, just cool people you would all like to hang out with who would love to leave their little strip of land and can't anyway. And then Israel brings the whole tower down. There's video of it. So it's okay. They warn it, but why are they bringing down residential and office towers while everyone is silent? And Allegedly because there's Hamas. They always say weapons. that. Well, they, that building. I mean, well, you asked the reason. So that's the reason they say at least. So well, this, this, this is the challenge for those that are not involved, right? I, I'm, I'm anti-war. I think U S involvement in, in 99% of things is, they're, they're lies. I mean, I grew up on this stuff, right? All, all the lies to get us to what put military bases surrounding Iran. Uh, John Bolton saying by this time next year, we'll be celebrating in Tehran. It's, it's bloodlust. So when I look at something like Israel, the challenge for me is I'm not nearly as involved as you and I'm not nearly as uh, uh, zealous as many of like the neoconservatives and the more conservative base. So when rockets come flying from uh, uh, from Gaza and start blowing up over Tel Aviv. I mean, this, this was huge, right? This was like 2014 when the rockets first started reaching Tel Aviv. Was that, because I remember uh, I had a friend in Tel Aviv. I was there at that time, yeah. Messaged, messaged me freaking out on Facebook that a rocket exploded over her house and this has never happened before and she doesn't know what to do. And, they're, and I'm like, man, this is horror. It's horror, it's war, it's terrifying. How do we stop this? And so what ends up happening is every time I've engaged with it, again, not an expert on this stuff. I mean, I probably might know a little bit more than the average person, but it's like, I appreciate your perspective. I'm glad you're here to tell us about this stuff too, uh, because I think only talking to people who are on the more Israel side is going to leave us, you know, blind to the arguments from the other side. Yeah. But I hear Israel; they're 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 using hospitals and schools and civilian areas to launch rockets from, knowing that it will make it extremely difficult for Israel to stop the rocket fire into civilian areas. Then I hear the same thing. But a media tower was taken down for what purpose? Why is Israel targeting this? And every time I hear this, my, my well, media is communications. I, I, I fall right back to this is war. And in in war, the rule the, there's no rules. Yeah. Rules are for in my it's like this idea of war crimes. I always find so silly. Like obviously, we think some things are so egregious that even in war they're a crime. But yo, the people who win those wars don't care what you think because you're gone. And so when I look at what's going on in Israel and Palestine, I know that you've got two factions that are going to use whatever arguments, whatever whatever psychological warfare, whatever physical warfare they can to try and win this. And I know that there probably is a right a right side and someone's telling the truth. And I know for a fact there's an objective truth and, and lies to what's going on. I don't know how to navigate that. Well, just two points on that. I mean, there's this issue of human shields. Like Biden said, Palestinians are human shields. That's a way of basically saying there are no civilians there at all. And the Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated places. It's like on two Earth. million people. There's yeah. like it's two million people jammed. Why are they there? By the way, that most of them are refugees, and they have to be there because they're not Jewish. They can't go back to the land of their families pre pre nineteen forty eight. They keep having kids. They're being warehoused there. They're surplus humanity. So it's like the logic of a prison, and so everybody there is a human shield. But there was a place I I like to eat because it's real cheap in in Tel Aviv that was right next to the. Um, defense ministry called Hakiria. And the, all the generals would be in there, the intelligence chiefs, good Mediterranean food. Are they human shields? Is, it, are, are, is, that, is building this giant tower in the middle of a residential area in Tel Aviv, are they making those people human shields? If that gets hit by Hezbollah and people mm -hmm. die nearby, were they being used by Israel's human shields? No one will say that because the logic is so discriminatory towards Palestinians. No one will consider their position. And then the other point I wanted to make is just about the use of violence in this conflict by Palestinians who have tried 
everything. I mean, I don't know if you know about what the, the Great March of Return was, but it was sanctioned by Hamas, but it was a grassroots initiative in Gaza to just march without weapons like guns to the wall that surrounds them. And they were shot one by one in the legs. Many of them were killed. Uh, journalists were killed covering it. It was a complete bloodbath. And that's when the society said, you know what, we can't win with this tactic of, you know, walking to the fence and just asking them to let us in. They don't want us. That's, that's, and, and so, and everyone, and, and, you know, no one, everyone ignored that. And now they're paying attention to the violence. In Gaza used to have 9,000 settlers in it. 9,000 settlers who took like 30 to 40% of the water in a place of 1.5 million people. Why did those settlers leave? It was because of the second intifada. It was because of the violence that was applied the, and much more gruesome violence in many ways than we're seeing now because this was the time of suicide bombings. Um, people willing to die because they were so desperate, blowing themselves up in order to kill because they had no weapons at that point. Now, the, the factions in Gaza actually have reverse engineered Israel's military and they have weapons so they don't need to do suicide bombing. So Gaza did that. They got Hamas too. <laughs> Hamas did that. Then what is the West Bank right now? It's controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which is funded partly through the EU and State Department. They don't resist Israel. In fact, they arrest Palestinians on behalf of Israel. And what do Palestinians have there? In many ways, they have the same prison style situation as they have in Gaza, but with settlers all around them. So okay. what does that tell Palestinians? It tells them the only way to get this off our back is through violence. Is are, are there Palestinians who live in Israel? Yes, in like Tel Aviv and all that. Are they? Uh, they well, they live in an, mostly in an area south called Jaffa or Yaffa. Yeah. But I mean, like it, it, somebody who is of Palestinian. They are uh, one point five million Palestinian citizens of Israel, and they're said to have equal rights, but there are discriminatory laws on the books. Yeah, there's that's like, what I was like going to ask. Four hundred mosques, it? right? There's like four hundred mosques within Israel, right? Yeah, I mean the mosques op um, operate. Uh, I mean, there's pressure on them to like shut off the muzzin at night. And, you know, there's all kinds of like personal, like individual conflicts or cultural conflicts taking place. But yes, there are Palestinian citizens. What's the solution? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, it's like the generational question that nobody has the answer to. Offer Palestine to become the 51st state oh, of the come United on, States. Come on, come <laughs> on. Like, let's, let's, let's. I'm being 100% serious. Okay, that's, but that's, that's not, that's not where serious. Where is, see, Palestine is not a state. You're it can be. be. And no, it can Hawaii, if Israel Hawaii will, can be a state, Palestine Israel will not them. <laughs> Israel will never <laughs> let them be a country. <laughs> no, we, we work with Israel to make it a peaceful place. It, they, either that or listen, they're going to get annihilated. Listen, listen, What's no, the other no, choice, no. you guys? I, I, talk I, to I, me. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in asking Max, uh, Max, Max this question because of your extensive coverage of it, your views on, on the conflict. Yeah. And uh, right now, I think it's fair to say every single person wants peace. There's clearly a divide, though, and it's that Israel's view of peace is very different from the Palestinian view of peace and then say our view of peace, right? Middle of the road, anti-war Americans who are like, why are we involved in this and how do we make it stop? Or do we do nothing at all and stay completely out of it? Because like, what is, what is this? What, 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 how do we, if, if you know, if, if Hamas is like, we're going to go take civilians because they're bargaining chips for us. You've now got a story where I'm like, bro, I'm 37. This conflict's been going on a lot longer than I've been alive. And all I know is I watch a video of people storming a music festival, killing and kidnapping people. All I see- That's bad, we want I, to stop. I see three ways for this to end. Either it's the total obliteration and annihilation of 2 million Palestinians, or it's they refugee and they flee the land and they come here to the United States or somewhere else, or they are absorbed into another nation. I, 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 so, those are I, three solutions that Israeli <clears throat> leadership is kind of putting forward because they cannot exist with Palestinians in their midst. And I mean, e like Egypt, what, 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 Egypt doesn't want to take them and, and Jordan, was, doesn't Jordan doesn't want to take them yeah. and Why Lebanon doesn't want to, no one wants to take Palestinians, the Palestinians. Yeah. Why won't Egypt open up Rafa and let them come? Because it's politically useful to have the Palestinian problem. The fight, the fight sure. with it, between the, the Arabs and the Jews, that's politically useful to Jordan, it's politically useful to Lebanon, and it's politically useful to Egypt. It's yeah. for the same reason that many Americans don't want Hondurans or Mexicans coming across the border. Yeah, the Egyptians fair. look down on Palestinians and they consider them a burden on a society yep. with 90 million people with a very weak state uh, yeah. where yeah. there's a lot of poverty. Um, yeah, and Rafa, the Rafa crossing between Gaza and Israel was bombed today uh, with many people who are dual yeah. nationals trying to get out as Netanyahu and the Israeli leadership are saying, leave Gaza and we won't bomb you, but they have nowhere to go. Um, but, 
you know, on this issue of the solution, I mean, we're entering a very dangerous phase and we're looking at the Holy Land right now. So this does affect us all. If this conflict moves from a political conflict, which it always has been, it's not about the Bible. It's about the colonization of the land of Palestine and people trying to get their land and rights back. And, uh, and, and then another group of people trying to have a state run along ethno-religious lines as a Jewish state. If it moves into a religious conflict, we're all screwed and it's going there. This operation waged by Hamas and um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad was called Al-Aqsa Flood. It's about the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And what's been going on there is that the security minister of Israel, who's the biggest fanatic in Israeli society, his name is Itamar ben Gvir. He's led literal riots against Palestinian shops. He's so extreme, the Israeli military would not allow him in. He's been convicted in Israeli courts of terrorism. He is now the security minister because Benjamin Netanyahu needs him and his small party in order to maintain his coalition. He has been leading groups up to the Al-Aqsa compound of uh, Jewish extremists who try to break in there into the third holiest site in Islam in a direct provocation. And what they want to do is blow up the Al-Aqsa compound and bring back the third Jewish temple. And they belong to a movement called the Temple Movement, which sees the Jewish prayer that takes place at the Western Wall as phony, as fake. What they think the original prayer that took place there was the mass slaughtering of sheep continuously and they want to do that there. So this is the, these are the kind of elements that are provoking one another and leading us into a religious conflict that would be disastrous. We were talking- Real, real quick, doesn't Al in Arabic mean the? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. I just wanted to point that out because it's funny because we say the, Al, whatever, like we say the, the. <laughs> yeah. I, just, you know, I just thought it was interesting. <laughs> Al Jazeera, yeah. We were yeah. talking, I, I, I disagree about the context the modern context being the actual driver. And we were talking earlier today uh, before the show about the the actual driver. I, it is biblical. It goes all the way back to to Genesis, the, between, the feud between Ishmael and Isaac, or the, 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 the fact that the story says that Isaac was, God's cho was, was chosen by God and Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. Isaac's the father of the Jews. This is this this is like the Hatfield and McCoy feud on steroids. It goes back thousands and thousands and thousands, three thousand years or whatever. I don't know how far back, but people that put it into a modern context, I understand that, like because there are things that inflame the tensions, but the tensions go far beyond just you know it, it's it's deeper than Islam. Yeah. And that's the thing that most Americans don't realize. Americans think that it's about a religion, and it's not. It's an ethnic feud that goes far deeper than than a religion. I think that I, I, a lot of the tension comes from that, but the violence is coming from the colonization. Uh, sure, uh, it's it's you can always do a video chat and get past your, your hatred of each other, but if and you're if you're gonna die, you have I, a choice. And some people and can. I, don't I know. know. I know this this issue is particularly contentious. So yes, ladies and gentlemen. We, we, I, I do want to bring on, I'd love to bring on someone who, a, a journalist who has covered the Israeli perspective. Not that I think that you necessarily don't, but you do have your biases. I wrote so. a book about the Israeli perspective. It's called Goliath. And I lived in Jerusalem in one of the most Jewish areas for almost a year, just trying to absorb that. That's um, fair, but- it, I'm Jew it, it, And I'm Jewish myself. And I came to this understanding by first going on the Birthright Israel trip, which is a free trip for- mm -hmm. Jews, uh, it was then 18 to 25. And, you know, it's basically like the best sex vacation ever. Uh, like they want you to mate. They want Jews to have relationships because, you know, uh. we're not getting, you know, we don't proselytize. So they're encouraging you to have sex with Israeli soldiers. It's a big party. But I got wow. really, really into the situation there. And it was right at the dawn of the second intifada. Wow. And it affected me in a way that they didn't want it to. I mean, they did but propagandize I, I, us. So for there, there are obviously a lot of people who we, we got some chats where they're saying it's great. You're a real journalist covering this because, you know, but then there are other people saying that you're you're a joke and you're wrong about this stuff. But I do want to point out the 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 seemingly contradictory uh, uh, statement you made earlier. I, I say seemingly in that the, the people's view of tribal politics, uh, you, you had praise for Donald Trump's uh, peace efforts. <laughs> before the show i don't know if you want to depending on which peace efforts right for sure about. for sure but we're talking about north korea and south korea and you were saying like I, you know i won't speak for you but the crips and the bloods yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i mean a one point to you real quick before i get into that um if 
Christians should be paying special attention to this conflict because the Christians who live in Bethlehem, they have nothing to do with Hamas. They're not represented by any of these factions, but they are affected by occupation and they are being forced out of their lands where they are carrying the tradition of the disciples. Uh, the Anastos family, who I know, had a, the wall, the separation wall built entirely around their home and shop. And that was the end of their existence there. They are directly descended from the disciples. So this isn't just about Jews and Muslims. And by the way, Jews and Muslims resisted the crusaders in Jerusalem. We haven't always been enemies. But to your point about Trump, uh, no, you wanted to say something? Well, just the, the I wanted to point out that the the way you've characterized this you've you've called you've you've called jews terrorists multiple times and every time that anyone taught and then i talk about the the fact that the operation was a terror operation you push back on it so i, I understand that you have a a perspective and it's totally when, cool i'm not trying to i'm not trying to, to say you're wrong for having an opinion or having having a perspective but i do want to point out you you are characterizing the israelis as jews and you talk about how far right and and how bloodthirsty they are and the terror attack you you've been pushing back on and saying well it's not a terror attack and, and etc so i mean i just wanted to call attention to it. it it is not just that jews are terrorists or that the uh palestinians are terrorists uh, this particular issue this particular flare-up or whatever instantly. is because of a terrorist attack but it's not that one side or the other are the bad guys and the good guys i or at least i don't see it that way it's so. well it's a for me, it's about justice and injustice. One side is much more powerful than the other and has is, is, is been abusing them historically. But Israel, to me, does not represent Judaism. To me, that's an, not, that's an anti-Semitic point of view. And actually, anti-Semites try to implicate all Jews by invoking Israel's crimes. I see Israel as embracing the philosophy of Zionism. And if you go to Brooklyn and you see all those ultra-Orthodox Jews from the Satmar clan, they're not Zionists. In many ways, they're anti-Zionist. So all Jews are not Zionists. Back to Trump. The, I, yes, I, I mean, as we were saying before the show, I mean, I stood and cheered when he crossed the DMV, DMZ into North Korea. I never thought I would see an American president do that. And in some, and so, in so many ways, um, Trump going off script was the greatest thing about the Trump era. I never thought an American president would do that. Ad admitting the weapons deals of Saudi Arabia and all that stuff, the yeah. oil fields in Syria, it's, it was... He it's lifted, like not good things, but it's like he's saying it. Yeah, even with the bad things, he lifted the mask on American yeah. empire because he wasn't trying to be elegant about it. He just told the truth about what we are. Uh, <laughs> with 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 Israel, though, I don't know if you remember, but it was like in 2015, he went to the Republican Jewish Coalition and he said like, oh, I'm a landlord. A lot of you guys are landlords. We need to make a deal with Israel-Palestine. And the, they called him an anti-Semite for saying that. It's <laughs> like he's calling Jews landlords who are deal makers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then he changed and Jared Kushner came in the equation, his son-in-law. I mean, just, just imagine well, if Trump's son-in-law was Palestinian. What, 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 do you, what do you think about the Abraham Accords? Well, the Abraham Accords are a real reason why this happened, why uh, these attacks took place. Because the whole point of the Abraham Accords was to go over the heads of the Palestinians, put that whole issue in the icebox forever, let them stay in their cages or wherever, maybe give them a few crumbs, and then Israel will make peace with the monarchies who have all the money and all of the um, you know, sovereign wealth funds. And Jared Kushner's directly overseeing that. There's gonna be more Trump towers in Dubai. And meanwhile, Trump goes and assassinates Qasem Soleimani, second most powerful figure, a prestigious figure in Iran, who heads the IRGC, which has a relationship with the factions in Gaza, as well as Lebanon. I mean, he was setting the stage for all this. So the Abraham Accords, and the normalization with Saudi Arabia, between Israel and Saudi Arabia, the, the Al-Aqsa flood operation declared by Hamas was explicitly designed to undermine that. Like they openly said it. Then what, I, I guess the, the, the issue is everything leads to chaos. Everything leads to conflict. Well, everything leads back to Jerusalem in, in the Middle East and the Palestinians will not allow themselves the rest of the region especially these monarchs who don't answer to what, anybody except their own internal clan, they will not allow themselves to be ignored. What would happen if the security fencing, the barriers around the Gaza Strip were all removed and all the people of Pal Palestine were granted free movement? What would happen? Well, it would certainly reduce the drive to violence and revenge over time, but there would no longer, where, what would they be within what we call Israel? And this goes to the whole logic 
of Zionism. In order to have a Jewish state, you have to have a demographic majority of Jews within a certain territory, although Israel has no internationally recognized borders. The U.S. has a border, like you all support def defending the border. Israel doesn't actually have a border. It just has areas that it declares Israel, and then it says, we have a majority of Jews, we are the Jewish state. So the areas outside Aren't those the borders created by all the countries around it, though? <clears throat> well, Palestinians don't have a country. Gaza is not a country. Yeah, it's but a human warehouse because they're not Jews. But so, Jordan and Egypt and Lebanon, they all have borders. Yeah, Yes. So that, that's what but Israel declares the itself for... a democracy while violently demographically engineering a demog a majority of a specific ethno religious group. So, so that would be like the U.S. But, saying we are a white Christian nation. We're not deporting the migrants because they're not legal citizens. We're deporting them because they're not white Christians. That right. is the problem. That's why Gaza's there and has to perpetually be there. But I mean, they're having kids, right? The population's yeah. growing. Yeah. So. It, it doesn't, I mean, Israel could cut food off and stop population growth. They could do, they just cut off electricity, gas, and water. I mean, after Hamas came in and killed a bunch of civilians and, you know, shot up a bunch of, you know, houses and stuff. I mean, so, you know, I look at it and I'm like, if Hamas, perhaps you can argue that it is a roughed edge scalpel in their attacks, which results in, it, it backfire, backfires on them tremendously. Uh, you know, I want to see peace. I don't, I don't like the stories that, you know, I hear from you about what's going on in Gaza, but all I see with everything they've just done is they've exacerbated the problem tenfold. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, why, why would they do this? They have no, from their point of view, there's no other diplomatic path to getting out of the siege. And the siege was becoming too comfortable for Israel. They had, a, Israel's always going to be in a comfortable situation as long as the Palestinians don't do anything. Fi firing rockets They're doesn't accomplish anything for them. What, is, what, what do they gain by firing rockets? Well, I mean, in, in, each, in each conflict, the more rockets, I mean, and this is not my justification. I've been under those rockets too. It's not pleasant. It's not as bad as being under the Israeli missiles that I've been under, which is absolutely horrifying with a drone over your head all night and you wake up and houses are blown up around you, but it's still scary. The point is they get concessions and it's the only way and the only time that Israel has ever given them any concessions, whether it's more work permits. I, I, all I, I, all I, I hear is terror works. Like, but, all but, I hear you saying is or, terrorism works. Or let's let's look at it from well, this perspective. Power works. Let's make the other hypothetical. State terror works as well. Or, I mean, or we're the masters of it. From from the perspective, uh, from, from your perspective, you could make the argument that Israel lets them fire the rockets to justify the, 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 the expansion of control over the Gaza Strip. And that you're saying it works Maybe they want it to work. They want Hamas to constantly attack civilians so they can go to the international stage, they can go to the United States, they can go to foreign countries and say, see, this is why we need money and this is why we're justified in controlling the things that we control, having the Iron Dome. I, I kind of view it like, 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 like right now, for the average American who has no idea about what this conflict is rooted in, all they know is that civilians were massacred. Can you tell me... It, it, it is... Uh well, go ahead. Tell me about the Balfour Declaration, unless you want to keep going. This is about the inception of the idea of the British mandate for Palestine we talked about last night. Basically, the end of World War One, the Arabs were fighting with the Ottomans, the, the Germans and the Austrians, and they were des they were winning the war. So the British and the French manipulated the Arabs, and they were like, if you betray the Ottoman Empire, we'll give you this land we call Palestine after right. the war. So the right. Arabs were like, sweet. They betrayed the Ottomans. The French and the British won the war, and then they went back on their deal with this secret declaration, the Balfour Declaration. Can you take me from there and talk me through? Uh, after we we cover where where, where you were at, uh, Tim, uh, which the gist of it was... being to the average person around the world who doesn't follow this stuff, yeah, Hamas just committed a major act of terror, right. killing civilians. Right. Well, the 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 yeah, to the, but that's because they're being propagandized by corporate media, which is telling them this is unprovoked. I mean, just look up how many. But times but, but provocation unprovoked. is is immaterial. I mean, like. For for me, when I cover this, context I, isn't material. But the reason, but I, that, the I, reason that they did it was because otherwise they're consolidating permanent siege in the Gaza Strip. And yes, it's it's a fact, as you pointed out, that Israel initially supported Hamas. Actually, the Mossad funneled money, as Robert Fisk reported, into Hamas's coffers in the 1980s because they wanted to destroy the PLO, which was secular, more socialist oriented, and they saw them as the greater threat. Israel allowed Hamas free movement around the Gaza Strip when Israel internally controlled the Gaza Strip. But we're, ent we're entering a new era in world, in international relations. 
a multipolar era where the United States doesn't matter as much. And so while we, this, this is kind of a, a bonanza for Israel to be able to show these images of a music festival being attacked and so on, but the United States doesn't matter as much in the region and Iran is emerging as a regional power. So I think the calculus on the ground is changing a little bit and it's moving more in favor of the Palestinians as long as, and, and, and I think that is another factor in why this took place. Um, on the, Balf the Balfour Declaration, I mean, you're, you're talking about the earliest stages of the colonial powers handing over the land of Palestine to those they saw as a more powerful force. And a lot of it was motivated actually by anti-Semitism. I mean, Balfour didn't have kind things to say about Jews in the UK. And so he thought that if we actually displace our, what he saw as a Jewish problem onto the backs of an indigenous population, just get our Jews out of England and put them there, it's gonna be a good deal for us and they'll be our allies eventually. And we, maybe we can use them to control the Suez Canal perpetually if we lose control of it. Um, there, uh, the, 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 the English anti-Semites were not the only anti-Semites in history to see Zionist colonization as a positive thing. Uh, the largest export market for the Zionist colonies in 1930s and pre-state 1940s Palestine was Germany. And the Zionist movement, the labor wing, the you know, quasi-socialist wing, actually inked a formal deal with Nazi Germany called the Havara Agreement, the transfer agreement. Anyone can look this up, it's on the books. And basically what they were doing was they were exchanging the property of Jews in Germany for their bodies. And if more Jews means we'll start to move towards a Jewish majority here and they'll, they'll fight the indigenous people. And then the Nazi, Nazi Germany was saying, well, we'll get their property and we need their wealth. So it was a very convenient arrangement um, David Ben-Gurion's number two, his name was Heimar Loserov. You don't have to worry about the names, but he was actually assassinated when he bragged about this deal in Tel Aviv. So there's been tons of collaboration with anti-Semites in order to consolidate the colonization of Palestine. Now look at this, this, this carrier battle group that's go, sailing into the region. There's so much we can say about it, but, what it's, but, here, but one thing it says is that First of all, Palestinians have no sovereignty. They cannot call on anyone to support them militarily. And I mean, Iran, Iran's kind of supporting them militarily. They aren't can't they? come in with a, you know, their Iranian fast boats or whatever. They, they can't really come in there. They can't get in there. Let me, let me pull this story. We have this from the AP. The U.S. will send a carrier strike group to the Eastern Mediterranean in support of Israel. So this news came just the other day. It's on top of what we're hearing now from CNN that the U.S. is offering special forces as several of the hostages or some of the hostages taken are believed to be Americans. I was saying this the other day. My concern is if Americans are captured and some of these uh, one, one of the one of the one of the individuals that's taken hostage is an IDF soldier who is a dual citizen, American and Israeli, which creates all sorts of questions about should the U.S. be involved? No question. The U.S. is going to use that. They're going to say that's an American citizen, despite the fact it was also an Israeli citizen fighting on behalf of Israel, you know, in a conflict. But now with the deployment of a carrier strike group, I'm, I'm curious the, the chance by which the U.S. gets involved in a direct conflict, which is a dram dramatic escalation and, and what could possibly happen. Do you think the U.S. I mean, look, the U.S. is involved. This is it. Deploying a carrier strike group is involvement. But where, where do we see this going? Um, Hezbollah took out an Israeli cruiser class ship in 2006 with, I think, a French Exocet missile that was smuggled in. It was one of their surprises. So they, in the southern Lebanon, have the capacity to take out ships. I don't think they'd be stupid enough to do this, but you now have U.S. assets in there that are just a trigger point for yeah. World War III. It would probably be better if there were fewer U.S. assets in the area, honestly. Just because of the, just because yeah. like Max Does is this saying, it's, it's, then you have the potential US is, is this in, in 2014, I remember uh, Protective Edge kicked off and I'm hanging out with a bunch of journalists and they were concerned about a very slim possibility of World War Three, that actions taken against Gaza could incite Iran and then Russia and then China. And then you get, you know, m much like the, the assassination of uh, Franz Ferdinand was not to at that time when that happened. Nobody said oh, that, that's it. It's World War One. Like the World War started. No, the assassination happened. It got reported. And then over a long period of time, treaties kick in. Eventually, it's called the Great War. We now call it World War uh, World War One. 
there was fear that Protective Edge could lead to something like that. But ultimately, it didn't. It was 51 days. Now with this, with the U.S. being more directly involved with the active war in Eastern Europe, which is very much related to energy, Syria, the Syrian conflict, and Iraq and a bunch of other countries, and then the fear that China moves on Taiwan, we could be really knocking on a legitimate World War III, knocking on the door of. Yeah, I mean, and I think Syria in a lot of ways was kind of a... a, a a, a laboratory or a, a sort of a, t a test case for World War III because you had Russia coming in with Iran and Hezbollah to stop U.S. and Western proxy forces who happened to be aligned with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And Israel was actually supporting Al-Qaeda and ISIS in the Golan. It was giving them weapons. It was allowing them to pass in and out of the Golan. Actually, Moshe Ya'alon who was the Israeli defense minister at the time. This is a headline. I would prefer Islamic State to Iran in Syria in the Times wow. of Israel. You can look that up. Um, so now, now- Is that look, because of the, the difference between the Shia and the Sunni Muslims? That and that they are just weaker and they don't want to fight Israel because in many ways, they're just a creation of the West. Um, I mean, if there is a regional war, all those Al Qaeda forces in Idlib in Syria that resist that fought the Syrian government, they're not going to be fighting on um, against Israel. And they're kind of like on Israel's side, Al Qaeda and ISIS. I mean, just think about that. But uh, what could happen here that I think could set the region on fire is, and it's already happening anyway, is if Israel tries to march on Gaza City. Uh, it would be a disaster for them. They'd lose you, so many people. There would be thousands and thousands of casualties inside Gaza. It's not favorable terrain for did, Israel. Didn't and, uh, IDF go on the ground in 2014? Yeah, and it did, didn't go very well for them. They went into an area called Shujaye, east of Gaza City, and lost something like 40 soldiers, including wow. officers. They totally underestimated the Al-Qassam Brigades, the armed wing of Hamas, yeah. and they retreated and then blanketed the whole area with howitzers and missiles which is why that if you look at the rubble from 2014 it's that area i've been there we filmed it it's in our film killing gaza but if they go all the way to gaza city and they're already softening it up they've like destroyed an entire neighborhood in the center of gaza city where all the administrative buildings are all the cafes the middle class lives if they go all the way there and they try to bring down hamas and occupy that area hezbollah will have to enter they will not allow Hamas to fall. They basically have an informal treaty. And then what can Hezbollah do? They are so much stronger than Hamas's armed wing. They can actually do targeted strikes throughout Israel. They uh, gave Israel a bloody nose in 2006. Israel failed to defeat them. Uh, and I don't know where that will lead. It could, it could then lead to more forces intervening because that'd be, that'd be Sunni and Shia then agreeing with each other. If Hezbollah and Hamas agree that Sunni and Shia Muslims agreeing to be against Israel, right? So doesn't that open a whole other can of worms as well? It's like with Iran backing Hamas, which is Shia and Sunni, et cetera. Wouldn't, that's, that's a whole thing in itself already. Well, that's a, that's a great question to raise because, because Saudi Arabia, yeah. which we had exactly. thought of as sort of the, 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 the real Sunni mm -hmm. power that was supporting the overthrow. Yes, they were supporting the overthrow of Syria. Mm -hmm. They're different now. Mohammed bin Salman has kind of turned his back on the West and his statement on what happened on October 7th, uh, the attacks inside Israel mm -hmm. was kind of, he didn't condemn it. He said, we just call for peace and Washington's furious at him. Um, you know, our gas prices are going up right now. Yeah. He's, 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 not, he's not opening up the tap. He's pissed off. What's the story of Hezbollah? Who are they? Where did they come from? Hezbollah is a... Shia faction in Lebanon uh, that was really formed in the 1980s when Israel invaded Lebanon. Israel thought that the Shia, because they were a minority that had been mistreated, would be their allies and that they would greet them with candy. But then the Israeli forces started abusing them. Hezbollah formed uh, after the Iranian revolution with some support from Iran, and they became one of the most powerful forces in resisting Israel as it consistently attempted to occupy and reoccupy Lebanon. And they are responsible for forcing Israel out completely in 2000. They acquired anti-tank weapons. Uh, they were um, training in combined arms tactics. 
And in 2006, Israel again attempted to destroy Hezbollah. Remember, Condoleezza Rice called it the birth pangs of a new Middle East, um, basically a test case for the war with Iran. And they repelled Israel when Israel came in again with tanks. Um, and Hezbollah has only gotten stronger. They are led by a political wing. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah is their spiritual leader. And he is an, he is an ally of Iran, but not a proxy. He's very, in, some, in many ways, he can influence the strategic calculus that Iran makes. And they do also have Christian supporters because uh, they are in, 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 they're like a state within the Lebanese state. And they prioritize resisting Israel, which is really popular there, whereas the Lebanese army is totally trained by the U.S., just like the Palestinian Authority. They're there just to keep the peace. They don't do anything when Israel attacks. And Israel has done so much damage to Lebanon that, that Hezbollah is just popular. And Hezbollah intervened in Syria in order to defeat Al-Qaeda. I actually went to one of the villages where they intervened called Malula, which is the oldest Christian uh, settlement in all of the Middle East. Actually, uh, the Passion of the Christ, if you saw that, all of the extras from the Passion of the Christ came from Malula. They speak um, Aramaic. Wow. One of the last places in the world Aramaic is spoken. Mm -hmm. And Al-Qaeda took over. Wow. Uh, Turkish NATO-backed forces of Al-Qaeda and Qatari-backed, and they took the nuns hostage. So uh, and, uh, and Hezbollah came in and liberated that town. So I'll, I'll, can we pull up Christian this map? town. <laughs> pull up this, uh, we have this map here. And... Uh, Take a look at Iran. Look where Iraq and Afghanistan are. Most people don't know their geography. No. And so uh, when you wonder about the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq, and uh, uh, the U.S. has uh, consistently been trying to, uh, you know, what, what, whatever you want to say. Like they, the, these, these uh, elements within the U.S. government want war with Iran. And when you understand the uh, Cutter Turkey Pipeline as one small story in all of this, I would, I, 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 I would say on the surface... It seems that all of this, everything we're talking about, is about supplying Europe with cheaper energy to compete with U.S. adversaries. Yeah, controlling is the it, trade would routes. Would you agree, or what do you think? Um, when the U.S. began sanctioning Venezuela and Iran, it had to then take its oil from Russia. Right. And now we're sanctioning the crap out of Russia so the oil prices are going up and Europe, I mean, they're screwed. Germany doesn't have a plan B. Mm -hmm. You know, the Green Party is in, part of, is in their governing coalition. They wanted to take an even nuclear offline. Now they're bringing, what, 26 coal-fired plants back online. But why, why are they doing that? Why, why not just go nuclear? Because they're the Green Party. <laughs> I mean, it's completely <laughs> ideological. This is insane. Um, so the point is, more people need to hear uh, this that. is this is blow, <laughs> this is blowing back <laughs> this this entire drive for war with iran regime change in venezuela having uh you know turning ukraine into an unsinkable aircraft carrier it's destroying <laughs> it's destroying europe which the u.s kind of likes for now because we sell them our liquid natural gas that they weren't trying to buy but it will eventually come back here and it's hurting the american consumer already everybody's feeling it so uh, we can pull up the map real quick. For those that uh, don't understand, there was a story, I think it was in 2012, The Guardian reported that as of 2009, U.S. intelligence wanted to destabilize Syria because we wanted to build an, uh, a natural gas pipeline from, I believe it was the Persian Gulf through Iraq. Was it the Persian Gulf? It was, it was through Iraq, through Syria, through Turkey, into Europe. Uh, partly, uh, or I should say a uh, majority of, of the, re the largest reason why was to uh, offset the Russian Gazprom natural gas monopoly. Syria said no. Syria is uh, allied with Russia and outright refused to allow this. Of course, they also have uh, Russia as a military base in Tartus, which is, uh, where is where, there it is, right, right here. Yep. And so uh, conveniently for the United States, whatever you believe, Syria falls into civil war with the United States on the side opposing Assad, whatever side that may be. And uh, uh, it, it seems like now with Ukraine, with Burisma, all of these things are deeply connected to we are trying to get cheap energy into Europe. It's a very simple way of putting it. Nord Stream gets blown up. Yeah. Where's the U.S. military in Syria? It's well, in the northeast where, all, where the Conoco oil fields yeah, are. Conoco well, Trump, oil. Trump told us that. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Well, Trump tried to pull them out. Yeah, and they, they lied about it. If, if I they, understand correctly, they're actually, uh, they were in Iraq, based in Iraq, and, and going to Syria, Syria yeah. from Iraq. But 
if I understand and and right. Trump wanted to get our troops out of Syria. It's really funny because when was the for formal declaration of deployment, right? It's it, like just all of a sudden it's like we have troops in Syria. It's like it's wait just, when? Well, the thing July. is, but the re the reason that there the reason there was no de declaration is because it was special forces. So it was like Delta right. and stuff. Like, so those dudes they and don't. And then they lied to the American people. That's because, because it's the Delta. Amer they the American people it. voted for a president who was saying no more to these garbage wars. You know what grinds my gears? That that was that was me when, in, in 2008. Barack Obama. And I was, and, 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 you know, I very much was listening to what Ron Paul was talking. My friends were all very into Ron Paul. And then when it came down to the actual election, my friends were just like, dude, he's clearly not like the establishment. This is our one chance. And I was like, okay, oh, whatever. I mean, I'm in Chicago. I'll vote for him. I don't know if it means anything. And then he went, what well, was the, one of the first things he did was he bombed a village of women and children. I think he killed 23 or something like that. In Yemen and Hodeida, right? Was uh, Perhaps. All I know is I'm at these anti-war protests. They're saying George W. Bush is Hitler. And then Obama's like, oh, Obama, get our Obama, yeah. I what? thought we were talking about the Trump era. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Obama did. Yeah. Yeah. So George W. Bush, they're calling him Hitler. They're waving these signs and they made the Hitler mustache. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll vote for Obama. And then I think it was like within a few weeks. Actually, I think it was like three days later after his inauguration. Women and children killed, 23 or so. And then I was just like, oh, okay. No, that was... Well, there's a lesson learned. That was my ticket out of the Democratic Party forever. Was no, it? that was me, right? I was just like, oh, so everybody's lied to me and I'm an idiot. I was pissed. And then I didn't vote again for 12 years. Well, I mean, it was so much crazier than like just believing in it. It was like he got a Nobel Prize before he came in. I a almost, Nobel Peace Prize. I almost... Yeah. I, I, f I was really, really, really upset when that happened because I was like, he literally did nothing. This means this is cheapening the value of every single Nobel uh, that has been given out before. Right. He got an award for being not George Bush. And there was no reason to believe other than, you know, he had a nice smile and was ch charismatic. There was no reason to believe that he was going to have any different policy. There was no change. And there was no change. In fact, he shot just as many missiles and violated no, the constitution just as more, badly and worse he yeah. killed he killed i think he killed more american citizens than any other president i mean well, I, I think know. he's the only well he's the only guy that ever targeted american citizens yeah. it's the openly only one. without yeah and and targeted them without without judicial you know without due process what, what it just i'm just so disgusted by all this man it's sickening the, the 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 idea that we've talked i can't remember who i was arguing with but they were saying that the president has a wide uh what's what's the uh birth not birth but like uh, a mandate in terms okay. of defending this country and if that means american citizens overseas i'm like no it that doesn't is, that is so that <laughs> no, is such fabrication to to apologize for the guy they like doing illegal shit that's yeah. all it is dude i'm sick of this too and i've been thinking okay federal reserve formed in 1913 world war one begins in 1914 maybe a coincidence maybe World War II ends in 1945. Israel is formed in 1947. Maybe, probably, okay, I'm well, done with the coincidences now. The, the British and the like, French wanted that area of the world. It's We've been in perpetual war for 115 years. This is one war. It started in 1914. We're still there. We're still in it. No, no, it's not one It's war. been cold for a while. It's been proxy. Yeah, Ian, it's the same Ian. fucking thing, man. You can reduce it all the way back thousands it of years. It began in 1914 with no, this banking didn't. takeover. No, it didn't. I, you, know, you know what really frustrates me? As I occupy Wall Street, and they were having a general assembly meeting to determine what should be the goal. And one guy stands up, waving his arms like, you just did, said, fracking is everything. No. Why can't you <laughs> see no, it? I'm not saying that conflict began in 1914. I'm saying this war, the Great War, began in 1914, and it has not ended. The reason World why, War II... Why did the alliances form? Why, why did the Because they wanted to control the world be, with the be, economy, no, man. No, no, no. Why, why did the alliances form that led to World War I? Uh, cousins, birthrights, money. The conflict a was lot well reasons. before this. You can get as reductive as you want. It goes back further. But the banking cartels, the Bank for International Settlements, the Federal Reserve was Bro, formed in 1913 and it set the, the world the on fire. Napoleonic Wars and, and, and uh, what was it? The, uh, Rothschild? Yeah. The, the, Those were the, not The legend of coming War. back and saying, yes, yeah. Napoleonic Wars was- were European wars, yeah. And what do you think World War I was? A global war. With what, what countries? It United was mostly, States. It was mostly based in. in I mean, it was mostly based in Europe. And World War Two. And, and these America, are European and United States. powers. It's when you took. When and North America got involved. Is when we started calling them World Wars. Basically. And yeah. with World War Two, you had the Japanese Empire, which was relatively separate from what the, the the what was happening in Europe. But yes, even the Napoleonic Wars, you could argue, was like World War. These yeah. countries had colonies everywhere: Australia, New Zealand. There's there's French uninhabited islands near Antarctica. Yeah. 
Like so, it was World War. It's been no, no, over no. There's, over there's been colonization since like the 1600s. And when, when, but when, when the, the French Empire, off in 1914. when the French Empire was at war with all the other countries of Europe, that included all of their colonies around the world as well. They fought war there too. There was they fought against the Russians, the, the Dutch. Ian, what you, I think what you're you're describing is the fact that the when the Federal Reserve came into being, it allowed the government to print money, which allowed the government to finance war, right? And also so, profit off of it. I don't know that that's the case because I think that they could profit off of war long before the Federal Reserve. But you get to blow things up and then loan them, give them as much of your money as you want. Your I mean, anyway, sorry to interrupt. Maybe, but the, but the point is that the the existence of the Federal Reserve unleashes. And and basically, not just the Federal Reserve, but but money that's not actually ta uh, pegged to uh, to gold. They can manipulate it much easier if they're printing money that's not pegged to gold. But the existence of the Federal Reserve is what really gave governments, the or specifically the United States government, the ability to fund wars. And when you have the ability to fund wars, then they'll go ahead and they'll look for reasons to go to war. But it's not like all the wars that you're describing are not the same thing. I think it's all one war. They say World War One and World War Two. It's World, semantic in my World opinion. War I and World War II the same are. thing. Then, 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 yeah. then you need to go back further than that. You need to go I, back to where these alliances come it's from. When the, I'm talking about this war is, began in 1914. But, but, but this war. Yeah, it's dude, the, this is war. a world war. No, it's been going on for 110 there, there, years there, there, and it's yeah. banker control. You, okay. You are ignoring the history of Europe. There's other wars that have happened. I'm not saying that this is the first but war. The I'm saying it's, it's the first. They, we're still in this war. It hasn't stopped yet. And it's been cold. It was cold. And now it's a cold war with China. And it's like been proxy. Yes. And Ian, when you say China's involved in the same war, you need to go back. They were involved before in World War, World war I. The you are choosing to hyper focus that was on the a difference banks because that's this, what you care about. This this banking war started in 1914. No, it didn't. No, I don't think. So. Uh, when do you think that the Federal Reserve war began? Before the Federal Reserve existed? Like, what are you I talking don't think about? That the you are you are the Federal Reserve is a symptom, a creation because of these things. I mean, you're Rockefeller ignoring and, the history and of where these started that freaking thing to control people, and you're ignoring where they where they come, came from and where their wealth comes from and what conflicts they were involved in. You are choosing to hyper focus on the Federal Reserve because that's your thing. But bro, uh, it's just all of this is reductive. No, no, it's not, man. It's a war, and it's semantic to call the Cold War not World War. World War One is the Cold War. It's the same These, shit. So, Ian, the, but the 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 world wars of the 20th century were wars of ideology. It was really people figuring out because in the in the 18th or in the 19th century, um, you had the basically. The, the Industrial Revolution made it possible for people to not live just agrarian in an agrarian society. You had people going to cities and stuff. You had this massive explosion in people that could be, become philosophers and blah, blah, blah. And so in the 18, in the 19th century, there was a lot of philosophers. They, were, they came up with the ideas of socialism. Fascism was, was, was the idea was, was created. Liberalism was a, was a creation that was also in the 18th century. And, and the wars of the 20th, or the 19th century, I'm sorry. The wars of the 20th century were kind of, or at least the first half, were kind of trying to hash out what, what system works best. You had socialism, you had fascism, you had liberalism. And it the way that it worked out at the end of the 20th century is it looked like liberalism probably was the best system for for humanity because it allows people to make mistakes without having it being a top-down control. So what you're describing is really more of humans trying to figure out the best way to to organize their societies and and fighting over the way to organize it because you went from the total war feudalism yeah. in the in the 19th century and then you went into capitalist societies and then that that's where you had enough production where people could start to you know just talk about socialism or fascism and whether the state should be in control or whether the individual should be in control but these things are all symptoms or the the wars that you're talking about are all symptoms of trying of of humans trying to figure out the best way to organize their society we're currently in fascism right now and it's not working very well I, we're not in fascism we're, right now we, we are in fascism. we're in we have private corporate we're, we're, pre let me let me finish this because i want to go on but there's a war between england and france called the hundred years war wars can go on that long mm -hmm. so just consider that maybe we've been in like it's not normal to be at war. Like we're not. How in a, long was that? Is not year true. War. war is the war is, war is the norm for all of yeah. human history. I don't think so. It absolutely is. I mean, there, you weren't there. How do you know? I, I don't. I don't think we have to be at okay, war. Okay. So, I, so, so we've so, been in a war my whole life. So, okay. But we've war, just been listen, winning it the whole time. We, we've, we've been in, we've been in a siege where America has 150 military bases controlling people's war behavior. War and violence are the norm for human society. Peace 
is extremely rare. And we are living in an anomalous time where generally our society is at peace. But now the it's war, the world's I, not. I, I know, I know that it's not the world. That's why I'm saying our society, Western Washington society Arizona. is generally at peace and it is anomalous. It is not normal in human history to not be at war. There has been, if you look at human history, it is drenched in blood and made of piles of bodies. The fact that we can get up in the morning and not worry about dying. Like I'm not in that is, place anymore. It's a huge, huge, uh, it's, it's totally unique to our time and place. I don't feel that. Any, I, I am worried about dying. That's fine. Or, well, that, I, mean, I understand. Yeah. That, I understand. pretend like we're not is just a ticking time bomb. I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is give you a little perspective and, or to, to pull you back from the brink because we are actually in one of the most peaceful times in human history. We, I got and, and human history is full of war. We're going to jump to this story. From Politico, RFK Jr. Super PAC raises $11 million within hours and courts Elon Musk's support. Just hours after RFK Jr. announced he would run for president as an independent, more than $11 million gushed into the coffers of a Super PAC supporting him. American Values 2024 said it raised $11.28 million in just six hours following Kennedy's announcement in Philadelphia on Indigenous Peoples Day. Are they seriously going with that, Politico? I, it, it's Columbus Day, isn't it? <laughs> According to a press release, millions of independent-minded Americans are seeing through the most powerful censorship and propaganda campaign against any candidate in American political history, said Tony Lyons, co-founder of the PAC, in a press release. They are angry at the DNC for attempting to disenfranchise them, eager to support an honest Democrat and more open than ever before in American history to an independent and honest candidate. So uh, I guess I'll just throw it to you, Max. I'm curious what your thoughts are on RFK. Uh, RFK Jr. is announcing he's running. Uh, do you like the guy? Do you think he's going to pull votes from Biden or Trump? I mean, I personally like him. I really hit it off with him. I felt like he was a like-minded person when I met with him. And I've been interviewed by him. He's completely woke in the good way of woke on Ukraine, on <laughs> issues of on Iraq, Afghanistan. And his opening speech for his campaign was in many ways inspiring. I mean, I thought it was a great anti-war speech. And he brought up his uncle's uh, wish to scatter the CIA into a thousand pieces. I mean, that was the message we needed to hear. Since then, his campaign has been completely deflated within the anti-war movement since he took on this uh, Likudnik kind of extreme pro-Israel dimension hmm. to it, yeah. which, and, and started to seem like he was agitating for war with Iran. It wow. Just didn't seem in his, like- In his speech? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you watch, he did this weird event with Shmuley Botia, who's this kind of like, Rabbi runs around calling everyone an anti-Semite who won't do what he wants. Um, he's paid by Sheldon Adelson, who was one of the biggest individual donors to Trump, who came in through Jared Kushner. And it was a weird event. I was like, did you get paid to do that? Like, is there some kind of incentive for you to take on this non-anti-war line? Because you see, I mean, if, if you're that pro-Israel, you're not going to like hang out with me. You know who I am. It, it just seems strange to me. So I, there's just been this feeling of deflation within the kind of anti-war movement, anti-war independent media, uh, within the sectors of the left that initially supported him, the grassroots left. And yeah, the Democrats were always going to screw him over. Yeah. And now the question is, what is he going to do as an independent? Because we knew, we know he was one of the boldest people in America speaking out against the propaganda and psyoping of the country during the COVID event, that would seem to drain from Donald Trump if he was an independent or whoever the Republican, a DeSantis. And I've, I mean, hasn't he, I've heard that as one of his, at his recent rallies, he's been attacking Trump in a more strident way. Hmm. So, well, it's, un, it's unclear what he's trying to do here. But you're, you're, you're not, you're not voting for him. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can't see myself doing that, but I, I don't really, it doesn't matter who I vote for because I live in D.C. Well, sure, sure. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of your your moral compass and your heart, uh, if if Trump beats Biden, how does that make you feel? Or if Biden beats Trump, like, do, does it matter to you? I mean, it, it, it matters, but I, I mean, I'm not I can't see myself voting for either of them. But what I, I mean, just looking at it from a more objective point of view, not me. I think this election is so much about whether you trust the system or not. 
And yeah. a lot of, and so yeah. many people who I just agree. simply don't trust the system are going to vote for Trump just to give the finger to the system. It's not, not just because that. Not because they like him. Uh, the indictments, uh, a lot of people who've been screwed over by the criminal justice system who are not traditional Republicans are starting to sympathize with him. The things he says about the system, about the deep state, the national security state, um, the media, everybody hates the media. It's the, it, it, <laughs> it's yeah, the worst. I mean, having been in the media for 20 years, yeah. it's like you get all the worst people in the country in one place and then just let them go crazy and dominate your mind. So Trump is the, I mean, I, I, I loved when he would call the media, the corporate media, the enemy of the people. So this, it, this is all, this is about that. And the people who have the most to lose from the loss of establishment control financially tend to be the Democratic Party donor class. I think so. I think I think he's you you can't pull from Trump for the reasons you described. I mean my 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 attitude toward Trump is I I just think he's the best bet in terms of firing people. You know, I, I think Ron DeSantis is a negotiator. I, I, I like a lot of his policies. I think he's running a bad campaign and I think he goes to DC and then he just says, you know, let's let's just negotiate and play ball. Unemployment. Yeah, Donald Trump <laughs> I think is just at this point he wants revenge. That's the joke we make. We made the poster of him that says revenge on it. And if he fires a bunch of people, I'll take what I can get. I don't like the, the, when, when it was Trump versus Hillary. I just thought it, I thought it was W. It was garbage. Like Hillary Clinton is a psychopath. She's a sociopath. She wants to murder people. She was the, she was secretary of state under Obama and all of that bloodshed. I'm like, Libya, yeah. <laughs> I'm in New York. You're not getting me to vote yeah, for this I mean, lady. Even Obama knew she was crazy. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. He wouldn't uh, yeah. let her buddy Sidney Blumenthal work with, uh, uh, in the government and Sydney's like a gun runner. He, he wanted to set up Osprey Global Solutions in Libya and he was like a long time advisor of the Clintons and Obama's like, I don't want him anywhere near here, Hillary, but she was having secret emails with him and like doing what he wanted to get his company set up in Libya when we took over. Just a dirty, dirty, dirty woman. But I mean, I, I wonder if, uh, I mean, I, I have to feel like you're not a Trump guy, but you'd have to think Trump is better than Biden. Um, I don't, think Trump is better than Biden based on him bringing, I, okay. I know, I, I know Bolton. And, what do you mean better than Biden? Well, I mean, look, Joe Biden is the perpetuation of the establishment warmonger, war hawk garbage, neo-lib, neocon machine. And Donald Trump is an extremely imperfect loudmouth who at least told us a bit of the truth, tried to get our troops out of uh, 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 Afghanistan and Syria and uh, no new wars. So if it's like, if you don't like his policies, if you don't like his character, if you don't like his attitude, I, I can I understand this libertarian argument where they're like Trump is bad. Here are all the really bad things he did, and I'm like, and isn't doesn't it suck that he was better than all the rest? And they're like, well, that's not saying much. I'm like, but it is saying something. I mean, there were things Trump did that I found absolutely horrible, like trillion dollar tax cut. Is from where I'm coming from, it's it's just uh, fueling the economic crisis people are in, and where I live in Ward Eight in D.C. I mean, oh. you just see total desperation. There is no program, no. There's no social safety net for anyone and it's fueling homicide. People just don't care anymore. Donald Trump did some <clears throat> off, you know, he, he brought John Bolton in, oh, he yeah. brought Nikki Haley in, he brought sure. HR McMaster in, he brought Jared Kushner in, he let Ivanka show him pictures of Syrian children supposedly, and then he acted missiles. on a false flag to fire missiles. So can you really trust him? Obviously what the establishment is afraid of with Trump is not what he does, it's what he says. Yeah. And then with Biden, well, we see what we get with Biden. <laughs> um, and yeah, seriously. And, but, and, but, and, to your, and, to, and to your point before, I mean, you know, you should play the man, not the ball. I mean, I, you, should judge, you, you can judge me uh, based on my work and the things I do. I think that's only fair. I think all those criticisms of Trump are absolutely fair. Yeah. And then it's still like he crossed the DMZ into North Korea. And it's like, no new wars. Perpetuation of wars, for sure. Uh, an effort to wind down and get us out of Afghanistan. When he even brought the Taliban to Camp David, he got attacked for it. And I'm like, negotiate, negotiate. We're done with this. And uh, he tried getting our troops out of Syria, except for the oil. And they lied to the American people about it. And my attitude is just, I'm not saying you have to support him or like him, but it's like, and I, you don't have to comment at all. That's up to you. I'm just saying for me, I look at it like, yeah, Trump may be in general bad. I don't know if a president could be good. But he's better than that. Then he's the best president I've had in my life. No, I understand why people feel that way. As a journalist, I'm just not going to be drawn into being like a court voice for, sure. for a candidate. It's because they're always going to disappoint you. 
what Trump right. shows is just he 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 lifts the mask on the fact that there is what you could call a deep state. I I just loved when he was in, it was like he was in front of the helicopter or whatever, and he was like, "We're doing this weapons deal with Syria. It's going to be great for the economy." And then all the anti-war left, they were just like, "He just said it. He just came out and said it." What did he do with the drone <laughs> weapon program? Uh, Luke was saying on the show that he gave control of drone assaults to the generals. Like, so he, he no longer made the decision of who's going to die. He just, so he's like, I, he kind of washed his hands of it and gave, yeah. what, what was that? Exactly? I mean, I know that he gave the CIA unprecedented powers to carry out black operations, including assassinations. Um, the CIA, love, it, it, which is funny because the CIA also was working against Trump. And I mean, John Brennan was running Russiagate and we, once you're in the CIA, you're always in the CIA. Like John Brennan being former yep. CIA and then going on MSNBC yep. and calling Trump a traitor. Yep. That's the C, he's speaking for a wing of the CIA. But meanwhile, the black ops guys in the CIA were getting to do whatever they wanted. So that's not cool. Yeah, I mean, they say no new wars, but he empowered the deep state by giving CIA authority to do a secret assassinations. And he also, the Abraham Accords on their face sound neat, but like you were saying earlier, it it put the Palestinian people in, a, in an ice box and gave the... Like the kings of Israel and Saudi Arabia, yeah, the can actual not, head can king of Israel, not literal kings, but the, the, the leaders, of, I should say, yeah, like Emirates and Saudi the Arabia. Wahhabi forces, like the most backwards forces yeah. in the Middle East, yeah, who yeah, are true. the least democratic, were going to get a complete win-win situation under the Abraham Accords. But so much for that. But so I, I just don't, I don't think you can trust what Trump will will do. It was his personnel but that really. I think he'll fire people. His personnel that's choices were like, abysmal. Abys so, so that's not, and I'm not question. saying they're what all. Happen, yeah. yeah. What happens if he fires people? What happens if he really starts draining the swamp? What happens if he um, goes into the State Department and just is like, "You're all out of here. No more USAID. None of this crap. Oh, FBI. Uh, you're all. You're actually going. You guys are going on trial on Alaska. for wiretapping me. No, send them all to Alaska. <laughs> I'm, I feel bad for the people of Alaska when I, I say was that. so depressed. They're, they're good people. <laughs> I followed a BLM march uh, up Pennsylvania Ave, and I and they walked right by the J. Edgar Hoover FBI building as if it didn't even exist. Yeah. And I was like, "That's how I knew this whole thing." Was <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy that like wiretapped Martin Luther King. Yeah. And just like, we're gonna go somewhere. But anyway, if Trump did that, I know from a source who was like down with Trump that tr one of Trump's greatest fears was assassination. I wouldn't be surprised. He, the, the, the new report is that he's, he, he only uses individual bottles of ketchup that he, are sealed. He is not as dumb as I thought. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, I knew people that were on the campaign trail with him in 2015 <laughs> said he only eats McDonald's. And the joke was he just loves fast food. No. The issue is that when you walk into a McDonald's, the burger's already made. And you can say that one right there. And you know it's not been tampered with. Whereas if you go to most restaurants, who knows what they're doing? So you're saying... The assumption is that if he tried to fire everybody, they'd kill him. Well, take Reagan being shot by John Hinckley to impress Jodie Foster out of the equation. When was the last political assassination, significant political assassination in but this country? Do you mean like admitted and acknowledged? Yeah, yeah acknowledged. Because acknowledged, we like Official then we'll record. then we'll skip over JFK and we'll well we don't, I mean there were more recent ones than that. George Wallace. Oh, oh sure, yeah, right. Okay, okay George Wallace was running as I think an independent candidate in 72 and he was going to harm Nixon because he had a lot of Republican, you know, Southern support. So he gets taken out. So you think Kennedy's at risk? Uh, the Kennedy family, I the mean, Kennedy family history is not, is not, you know, confidence not building. I don't no. think the Democrats are threatened by him right now. They, that's my sense, especially as an independent. I don't, and I don't think they're threatened by Cornell West. I think Cornell West effectively dropped out of the race. Yeah, and he just wants to have a platform to go around giving mm -hmm. talks. Yeah, he would have him on the show. He's pretty cool. He's a cool, he's a very wonderful human being, but he doesn't have a platform. Right. He just makes proclamations and uses a lot of isms. It's just disappointing to me because he's someone I, I have so much common ground with, but I don't think there's a threat right now to the establishment other than Trump. And obviously Trump's kind of like the front runner. So what will they do if he actually fulfills those promises? If he goes like dark Brandon Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a rhetorical question? I dark mean, yeah, I'm Brandon. just putting it out on the table so I don't yeah. have to do all Alex the Jones said that his plane would go down in a plane crash. That's how that they would kill him. I don't know. And like a lot of people would celebrate. Yeah, yeah. that Sick would be people. it. <laughs> Man. It is terrifying. Like they, trying to destroy, it doesn't make any sense to destroy the system right now. It just doesn't make any sense. The system's the least worst system on earth. It's horrible in a lot of ways, but 
It, yeah, the system works. It's just the people in the system that are that are the issue. People in the system that are not become wicked. People become wicked. The system has become wicked. You know, what is it? Greed. I'm saying the people that are in the system are who become wicked. The system itself, I agree, it works. But the, that's why that woman's saying fire people. We're not saying get rid of the positions. I'm, well, some people are saying get rid of the positions. Oh yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, there, I know. Yeah yeah, 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 I know. But uh, generally speaking, yeah, I agree. The system generally works because it's checks and balances, etc. But there are people in there that have made it so that their checks and balances kind of you know even out in favor of them. In the end, I of think the day. there are predators. Yeah, and predators. they view the world very animalistically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the attitude of so many people in power is all that matters is power, Yeah, you know, and then, and then there are the classically liberal individuals. And I don't mean the literal political liberal. I mean, people who hold some of these traditional American views of honesty, integrity, negotiation, cooperation, which uh, exist in a lot of different, you know, uh, uh, perif peripheral uh, 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 political philosophies. And these people think they're playing a good fair game with the predators who are laughing behind their backs. Yes. This is speaking of the history of our nation and, and predatorial behavior, how they're like land grab. And they're like, well, there's people there. No, they're not real people. They're called savages. Just take the land. That's, land. Does, it, that, is but it, that's it, the story of history. Again, right. that's like, it's, it's, it's not it's, like, and especially successful governments. So like there's a deer outside my house. You know what I mean? That deer is eating my grass. Okay. The issue is in, uh, if I was a farmer and an animal w uh, came onto this land, and said, my family has been here for a thousand generations eating the plants that grow here. Whose land is it? But does it belong to the deer and the rabbits that were eating the plants or the human who put fences around it and said, no, my family gets this now. There's the de facto rule of ownership, which is whoever's there and can take it and control it. And then there's the du jour type of ownership, which is I have the paperwork that says this is mine. Well, that's when there's a monopoly on violence elsewhere that you can appeal to authority to come and agree with you. But uh, at a certain point, conquest is 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 a real thing. I think we, we we're trying to advance to a point where we resolve matters through rules and legal channels, like I was mentioning with the classically liberal approach. Yeah. But the, I, I don't think you get rid of predator predators. Well, I mean, and if, it, they, if they can't use force, they'll use coercion. They'll, they'll use soft power. Jo Jordan Peterson talks about the the way that we interact as a game. And right. So we all kind of decide that we're going to play this game and we agree to the rules. And if you're a liberal and you live in the United States and, and you want to have a normal kind of life, you will b abide by the rules of the game. The people that don't want to abide by the rules of the game actually are the people that have more power than the people that want to abide by the rules. You, if you, if you decide you don't want to play and you want to use violence to acquire things, the rest of the people are going to say, well, we have a we have a a a situation that or we have a, a a process to take care of that and that's police and that's the the judicial system etc um but at the end of the day that only works because you have people that are willing to use violence and force to make the person that decided to step outside of the rules of the game play by the rules and the only rule when you get once you step outside of the rules of the game then the rules are just violence so max was talking earlier today about about the the behaviors of of the palestinians and they they don't have any recourse etc and so they're choosing violence but once you choose violence then it's just a matter of who's got more power right. in my opinion for the palestinians to choose violence is a terrible decision because they're going to get the shit stomped out of them because of the fact that israel just has more military power whether or not that and i'm, I'm not talking about right or wrong i'm just saying the actual conditions mao said actual political power comes out of the barrel of a gun and in you know, starship troopers, the violence is the ultimate authority that that all other authority gets its power from. And that is actually true. And so you have to decide, do you want to play by society? Do you want to have a society that has rules and has people that play by the rules or do you not? I mean, it, in, in, a, in a fair society, you have a choice. They didn't have I mean, they chose initially they attempted to choose negotiations. Look what happened with Oslo. They got record amounts of settlements built immediately in their territory, like literally in their olive gro olive groves and backyards. So they weren't living in a society that they had any control over. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I understand that. And I didn't mean to, to pick on what you were saying. I was just talking yeah, about- It's just the concept of what is a society or what is a citizen. I mean, a, being a citizen is you have the right to have rights. And, you know, theoretically we have that here, we have a constitution, but- more But that's than the game we play that I was talking about. More than ever, 
our rights are determined by a donor class and an unelected yep. group that's yeah, deeply embedded in the Agreed. government that we can't even see. Well, I should, we, 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 that's what I think has caused a political realignment, by the way, where a lot of people on the left and right who see that are moving away from these traditional labels of left and right and forming a coalition against what people crudely would call the deep state. Yeah, that's what we did at the Rage Against the War Machine rally in February. Is put oh, yeah. aside the left-right boutique culture war differences and just come together because the, the 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 fight against the Ukraine proxy war really was a fight against those elements. They've created this war, not us. The people didn't vote for it. And what I mean, is the Russia war, created the war? What's right? the war really about? I mean, it is about the banks. It is about one of our only productive industries getting flooded with investments. The arms industry. We don't make stuff like we used to in the US, but we make weapons and uh, Russia brought it hot. Holders. Russia yeah. brought, it, <clears throat> brought it hot, but war is war, man. Yeah, when you siege someone and you hold them in their house and, and then they break out and make it hot, it's like, well, that I, that's NATO on the doorstep, man. That's it, and I'm, it, that's Israel putting these people in a little open air prison. You know, you you put them right up against the wall and you don't let them move. Like eventually, if they lash well, out, that, who's at not, fault? I'm talking about Russia invading Ukraine was turning a conflict hot that had yeah, already been because brewing. we because we pushed NATO east and and it's the same thing yeah. with the Israelis pushing the Palestinians into Gaza. Like you push them into it and you don't give them any other opportunity. Like they Pressure. lash out. We're going to go to the same thing. Obviously. We're going to go to super chats. If you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show if you like it, and head over to TimCast.com. Click join us. The members only uncensored show will be up in about 25 minutes, and that should be very fun. We're going to have uh, uh, more spicy conversations, but uh, uh, check that one out. Let's read. Culture Abduction says, first, can't believe Ian is slowly turning into Seamus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Christian. I just love God and I love communicating with spirits and uh, prophets and things like that. And I'll keep doing it. Mr. Mr. Batalon says, fun fact, as per the Geneva Convention, protected locations lose their protected status, i.e. schools and hospitals, if they are used for military purposes, Correct. military operations. That's correct, yeah. Fix Bayonet says, Hamas named their attack after the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I won't be surprised if civilians tear it down. The Israelis would then be able to build the third temple. Watch for the Temple Institute sacrifices the red heifer. I don't understand that. Red heifer, it has to do, it's like the, it's, I, I'm trying to remember this exactly, but it, it's a, it's a significant religious symbol. I can't remember what it is exactly. I can help with that. Thank you. Uh, if I'm going to probably get it wrong, but basically <clears throat> you need the blood of a red heifer right. for um, something like Jews this. to be able to enter the compound, uh, and right. it's hard to get a red heifer there. So, oh. well, all right. Noah Sanders says, Tim, what happened to the Michael Seifert uncensored episode? I went to find my clip of saying he should do a shark tank, not even an hour after he announced on IRL and it wasn't working. What's up? Uh, I don't know. You want, you want to take that note down the Michael Seifert members only and see if, yeah, if there's something up with it later on. We'll try it. We'll, we'll get that sourced. Our crew is probably already on it because we have a crack team that is working to bring you only the best content at timcast.com. All right. Me Shoots says, finally got someone smart on the show. Now Max can pick on you guys like how y'all pick on Ian because, you know, insecurity issues. <laughs> I do love how polarizing you are with like there's a bunch of people being like you're so smart and you're so knowledgeable and others being like you're a, you're a fraud and a sham. You really <laughs> you, 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 you did it, I guess. Are they mutually exclusive? <laughs> uh, I think the overall, overall majority of people are just watching like the people who comment are like the top tier politically active individuals and they're going to have very strong opinions. 85% yeah. of the people who are watching are just like, huh, Max, I'll look, I'll, I'll see what this guy's writing about. And they'll, you know, Matt Gates pointed out that our audience is super rational and super like logical. And when he bumps into, he's like, you, you, you bump into like a Fox News viewer and they're like, hey, I saw you on TV once. You bump into a Timcast viewer and they're like, I thought about everything you said and I've written down this plan. So much more, <laughs> so uh, true, yeah. you know, involved. Let's grab some more. What is this? IDG says Brett Weinstein, Tucker, Vivek, Bannon, Alex Jones, Dave Smith, etc. are all coming to the conclusion that Israel had foreknowledge of the attack but stood down and allowed it to happen. Change your mind? Uh, I think <laughs> I think that uh, I would lean slightly away from uh, from that. I guess you could say this. I think it is completely reasonable to believe that to any degree, be it small or great, Israel did have foreknowledge of something. To then say that Israel stood down and allowed like these attacks and killings of civilians, 
I, I would lean against. I have no evidence, but it is completely within the realm of reasonability for a country to allow a thousand of their citizens to be raped and murdered and, and captured in order to go to war, to destroy yep. an enemy they want annihilated. I completely agree. It's called false flags. Countries that history uh, have, have utilized as governments, I should say, have utilized this tactic. But uh, I, I, do, I, do, I actually think it's not the simple answer, right? I think if we go by Occam's razor, it's Hamas, like you said, like the targeting of civilians is leverage for them to negotiate the release of, of their people. So a military operation makes more sense. And uh, uh, I, I suppose you could say Israel doesn't need this degree of conflict in order to justify what they're doing, especially as, as, you, as you mentioned, they shot people who are unarmed and there was no outcry over it. Israel has uh, something called the Hannibal Directive in its military, which allows the military to kill its own soldiers if they become captive, if they are held captive, because the political price of wow. them being held captive is so high. You know, they'd have to exchange thousands of prisoners or who knows what. And there's evidence that they have enacted the Hannibal Directive and attacked um, Hamas vehicles that were carrying soldiers back, live soldiers back into the Gaza Strip. So I'm not, I think that cuts against the theory that they allowed this to happen because their fear of it, one soldier right. being captive is so extreme within the mil the um, military intelligence establishment wow. in Israel, and now they have dozens and dozens. We don't even know how many. Yeah, I, I think typically the the false flag narratives, while possible, are usually on the more complicated solution as opposed to the simple solution. And the simple solution, when when we're, uh, one can what is it? Uh, in the absence of evidence, the solution that makes the least amount of assumptions tends to be correct. Israel and Hamas conflict. Hamas wants uh, captives for, uh, they, they take civilians, they take soldiers, they use them as political uh, 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 bargaining chips. Much, much simpler and least amount of assumptions as, a, as opposed to Egypt warns Israel. Israel says, aha, now's our chance. We'll utilize this to. There's also yeah. this, this image of Israel that they market to the world that they have the best intelligence services, that they, they're the surveillance masters. I mean, they make, they, they do, their economy thrives off of selling their spy tech yep. abroad. I mean, they have an entire unit called Unit 8200 that goes into the tech sector afterwards. I mean, they did that. Um, they were uh, the founders of Black Cube, the company that Harvey Weinstein used to tail his accusers. They're making so much money as consultants. So everyone thinks they're so brilliant and we overestimate them. In fact, the, they're kind of a paper tiger and they just got humiliated by a bunch of guys on motorcycles. Yeah, but the conspiracy theorists, the people that hate Israel, they're really good at telling people that the Mossad know everything too. And they like kill JFK. And yeah, so there, there's, there's a lot. I mean, so maybe we overestimate it, but it's not that it's overestimated just because of the people that are like in supporting Israel or Israel. It's like the people that hate Israel loved, they'll, they'll tell you Israel did everything. You know, yeah. I, my, my, my timeline on, on, on Twitter has been full of like, but don't you know the Jews control the sun and blah, 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 <laughs> you know, all kinds of like, man, yeah, with Mossad. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, it, it is, it is, it is definitely something that the c conspiracy theories have globbed onto and really push as well as, and it, and you know, they're not going to stop. They're not the, the Mossad and, and Israel's intelligence service. They're not going to be like, no, 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 no they no. like it. I'm they sure. like it. Yeah, absolutely. The drum night says war never changes. I yeah. love this one, but it's a line from fallout mm -hmm. where I think it was Ron Perlman, right? Did the VO and he's oh. like, war never changes. War. And it's just like war changes war all the time, changes. dude. Come on. Like I, I just, I always hated that line in fallout. War never changes. What are you talking about? There's all sorts of developments. Like guerrilla warfare was a major advance. Scorched Earth, like <laughs> war changes a lot. Digital warfare. Yeah, now you've got information warfare. Fan aerial vehicles. Yeah. Who invented oh yeah, right. Israel you know. invented them. But I suppose the argument is that it's always just about killing and destruction. Yeah. But yeah, I still got to say, eventually it's going to be robots fighting robots. It's going to be a bunch. Net. Yeah, like our drones versus their drones. Yeah. I mean, you see it over <laughs> Israel with the rockets versus rockets almost. It's machine on machine. Yeah, crazy. All right, where are we at? Let's grab this one. Uh, Glenn Manival says, Breaking Points had a good video on debunked videos and photos. A circulating video was a video game screenshot. Be wary of the fake stuff. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. If a reporter comes out and says, I'm hearing babies were beheaded, I'm like, okay, well, a reporter hearing something and an official statement from military or spokesman or something so I'm expecting, with evidence is very, very different. I'm expecting to see a blurry image of a baby with a head 
in the next week or two. I just bought a bunch of these, by the way. They're really good spin drills. Highly recommend. We don't have any up here. I got it. No, we should though. Those are Um, awesome. So be wary of seeing something because there could be false or deep faked images of babies with heads cut off. Just be very. You might start seeing images in the next three to five days, two weeks. To, to verify the claim they're not maybe they don't show it all at once maybe it's legitimate i don't even know yet alexander ali says has tim gone full neocon yet <laughs> no but between cassandra fairbanks and a lot eliyahu man i'm being ripped in two directions <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow>. yeah <laughs> it's funny when it's uh true, though. yeah cassandra uh is just so 100 percent purely anti-intervention mm-hmm. at any and and elad is he called himself the resident neocon yeah so he's it's that he, mustache he, yeah, he's a Bolton bro. That's right. And he's very much like the United States should be the unipolar power in the world. He doesn't want other countries getting a foothold and things like that. After having spent so much time in Israel, Max, like, do you, what's your interventional stance? Like, how do you feel about foreign wars and things like that? I mean, I'm an anti-interventionist. Uh, that's why, <clears throat> why I'm able to find common ground with people who are libertarians or conservative. Why I spoke at the Ron Paul Institute is, you know, we should not be over there. But I also think that's kind of an issue of like honesty and integrity. There are a lot of people that, you know, we describe these prominent left wing personalities as just agreeing with whatever, whatever tribal position and refusing to have conversations like their position will change with whatever the narrative is like, you know, well, uh, I, 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 I'm somewhat oh, reluctant yeah. to bring it up, but P- progressives it right. just means you follow the psyop at this point. It doesn't right. even have Current any thing. principles attached to it. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're like we we must support the war in Ukraine because we, we that's progressed the onto the next corporate thing. narrative. They, that's the young Turks in a nutshell. But I, but I think, did something happen with Cenk Uger yes. arguing with Hassan? Cenk, Cenk went on Hassan's show and they went at it. Cenk yep. was like, no, about? Hassan, no. Hassan was defending, uh, I think. The police, was, the police thing. Well, I, I, Hassan was was he was Hassan was saying police are bad, and Jenk was being like releasing yeah. these criminals is is making things yeah, worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the progressive narrative is no, release the criminals, and it's like so. But but Ukraine, I think, is a really great example of like people claiming to be on the left. If if you are if you, I'm out. Have they called you right wing yet? Oh yeah, far right, right. right oh, we got the article together. I mean, come on, that was that was that was like ten after, years ago. After today, <laughs> it's like finished. <laughs> what, what was it? What was that like? Uh, no, that was like uh, set, that was nine. No, what was it? Nine years ago? What was the article? When, uh, oh yeah, the Southern Poverty Law. But it it wasn't even like an SPLC job. It was like this weird character came in there, who is like this anarchist freak from Portland who had yeah. no journalistic chops, and he concocted this vast conspiracy that involved me. You like Katrina Vanden Heuvel from the Kalik nation, too. yeah. Her Stephen <laughs> Walt, and we were all controlled by Vladimir Putin uh, to enact this r- r- red brown conspiracy yeah. to like take it, over alt media. They, they had to apologize for it. It was That's it was absurd. Around. The SPLC argued that they called me alt right, I think, and they argued that I was right wing. Their source was no. They said you went to Iran, so Iran right. was controlled. Right, right, right. Yeah, but I think they said like alt-right Tim Pool went to Iran or something for a Holocaust denial conference or something like this, which is just like the most insane thing imaginable. I was like, I've never been there. This is crazy. You should print that article and put it on the wall somewhere. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's archived somewhere. <laughs> they, they, they had to apologize for it. But it's funny. I mean, a, a, it was a long time ago. But I think the interesting thing is the only I think the only thing that really connected all of us was we're uh, uh to varying degrees, but greatly anti-war and anti-intervention. Yeah, and and <laughs> so we're seen You're as a, right we're seen as a threat to the American order. Yeah, I, I could go deep into that rabbit hole, but it's going to bore everyone watching this. But anyway, I I called the Southern Poverty Law Center and said this is bullshit, and they retracted all three. Like on that's the crazy. Spot. But it's it's just because they were afraid of a lawsuit. Good, good, and uh, and I should have just done the lawsuit. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> well, I I I think. I mean, it's tough because I don't, I don't think they, I don't think that, I don't think you'd win that one, right? Right wing is an opinion. It's a nebulous statement. And that's, that's why they get away with it. But I think it's hilarious how if you are anti-war, they're just calling you right wing these days. Well, Majid Nawaz won a $30 million lawsuit against them because they called him an Islamophobe. Oh, So that was a characterization as well, but. Interesting. He, he, and I think, no, it was a, it was a settlement because right. they actually didn't want to go to court. I think it's, I think, yeah, honestly, I think you should have sued. And I think all of us, it should have been like a class action. Well, I, I, I got called by some lawyer or something. I, th- I thought there was like a, some lawyer involved. Yeah. I don't know. It's been 10 years, man. I they got a lawyer's letter. But any, anyway, you're right. But, Everyone but, had like a similar opposition to the U.S. just dominating the world militarily. 
and you look at China, whatever you think about China, what countries have they attacked like recently? Tibet. Well, that's not really a country and it wasn't any cost to them. But they're, what I'm saying is they're not going thousands of miles away and taking over, sending their troops into conflicts like Iraq. And they're not weakening themselves. They're preparing. They're buying stuff. Well, they, yeah, they they're buying stuff. stuff. They're creating infrastructure. They're, they're creating, cutting deals. And that's how they're going they, to do it yeah, creating with a handshake. Yep. Yeah. And the U.S.'s only move apparently is bombs, which it's yeah. just, that's why I'm like, this stuff doesn't work. Secure our borders, build up our manufacturing base, cut these these garbage international treaties, and then lead by uh, uh, wealth and, and like... Right. Prosperity. Yeah, make people want to be like us and build cultural influence. I guess mm -hmm. the, the Tibetan, it wasn't an invasion, a Chinese invasion, it was an annexation. Uh, Tibet used to be a country, and then at what point, like 50 years ago, China was just like, now you're part of China, or they just keep saying it, and Tibet's like, we have no voice? Is that what's going on over there? Well, the Dalai Lama was a CIA asset, as were his forces, and he, they were being used uh, as uh, the... Um, the, the Uyghur nationalist movement was by the CIA to balkanize China. And China went in, the population was living under a boy king in abject poverty. And China went in and much of the population actually welcomed them because they started to get homes and to be able to not worship a boy king and have infrastructure and plumbing and electricity. Uh, but there's also a Tibetan exile nationalist movement that's just viciously opposed to china and where are they based here where where's where are the uyghurs based here in northern virginia right near langley and the national endowment for democracy is funding all of their ngos so this isn't a judgment on whether they're right or wrong it's about we're gonna read some more we got this uh from alejandro reyes his boy i'm glad failed all that rem remains lead singer is here for sanity's sake but thank god someone is having this <laughs> argument i never was able to have one with people i know we should put a gold record on the wall behind you. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, bring one, yeah. And you can hang it up behind you when you're here. <laughs> right failed on it. All right, we'll grab some more Super Chats. What have we here? David Guyton, uh, Guyton says, Tim, I make metal sculptures on my YouTube channel. I made you a Memento Mori mask based on Stoic philosophy. It's yours if you want it. Oh, cool. That's sick. Um, I don't know how, how to go about sourcing that stuff, though. Uh, tweet at Ian. Uh, I'm open to that. <laughs> Tweet. I have no other response. Like I don't know how to. I don't know. How Tweet to... at me and send me a direct message. Do both. Edgar Ortiz says, "Good on Tim for having a credible journalist such as Max on. Not sure who the other guy is though, but could learn a little something from Max. You see, you get Talk one person that. being like Phil, you're so right about this. Another person says Max is so right about this. I can, I, 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 I respect the, the, the. Well, that's uh, what happens when you have conversation. so many diverse guests on. Yeah, I'm the failed musician guy." That's who I am. Oh, but I mean, typically, like, the left doesn't come on the show. It's it's pulling teeth. Yeah. It's impossible, you know? And so then, you know, I, I don't know. It is what it is. It is what it is. It's frustrating to me because the left could get so much more done if it would just focus on issues instead of virtue signaling. Yeah. That's, which is a large component of what our issue is. Yeah. You know? And so, like, we, 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 we've had some leftists on, and we have, like, these, these like, books, like, This Book is Gay, where it's got explicit material and it kids should not be exposed to. Some leftists we bring on will say, no, I agree, you're right. That book should not be for kids. I don't know why they're even defending it. And I'm like, well, then you need to speak up because you're you're saying nothing and like lowering your head while these other people we've had come on the show just explicitly defend it and say kids should have it. And I'm like, you're just saying that because that's the progressive line of like the narrative that, or the psyop. All right. What is this? Well, that's the that's the dividing line issue. It's like, okay, you're not with me on the trans issue, so we can't work together on against anything. Ukraine. Yeah. And to me, that's so much more important than the trans issue. And so I'm willing to I'm willing to work on it with a on a tactical basis with the Freedom Caucus with Marjorie Taylor Greene. I might not agree with her on other things. Yeah, but like, I mean avoiding World War 3 might you know, be pretty important. Yeah, I'd like to disagree later. Let's stay alive. <laughs> and at the gray zone, yeah. we'll, we'll like promote their initiatives to end. We have promoted Paul Gosar's initiative to end uh, the emergency declarations on Libya, Syria, Yemen. Uh, and this is free, the Freedom Caucus. These declarations yeah. are used to make war on those countries. And the left is just giving them the cold shoulder when they totally agree. So I, I think I, I, I think AOC is an evil person. I think she is a fake I think she's just going through the motions. I don't know. It's it's. I, I think she'll be the she'll be the establishment. She'll be the next Nancy Pelosi. She's the new Obama. Well, there you go. Or that. Right. That works. Yeah. 
We, yeah, need, we need allies let's, now, so let's let's work together. All right, PTB says anyone who likes Malort hates themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Wormwood's okay. great. Oh, I'm not trying. You know, I want to be careful because I don't want to rag on Malort. I'm from Chicago, but the uh, Chicago joke is he just says he drinks more. <laughs> Uh, for those that don't know, Malort is like a prominent, it's a well-known liqueur in, in, in Chicago. It's Wormwood liqueur, right? Yeah. And people in Chicago think it's horrible, but they want everyone to drink it. And so they buy tons of it to get people to drink it. And the joke is it's distilled from the grass that grows on the side of Interstate 55. <laughs> so everybody from Chicago it knows. Tastes like I it. <laughs> <laughs> I just have it. You like the it? grass I like. <laughs> All right, where are we and, at? Where and I'm a self-hating Jew, so. <laughs> Do you believe you in God? You've gotten some of those comments for sure. <laughs> in a way. A side of salt. I, well, no, let's read this one. A side of salt says Hamas is in charge of Palestine. Their charter calls for the eradications, uh, eradication of Jews and Christians. WTF? Do you mean it's not religious, Max? The Hamas charter was formally changed to remove those anti-Semitic passages in 2016 or 17. Uh, it's no, it's no longer there, but I don't know how much time we have. I'm, I would love to address the issue of Arab anti-Semitism. We can, we can go, we can go nuts on the, on the after, after show in a few minutes. Yeah. We'll just, we'll, we'll go deep into, you know, all this stuff and I'm sure it, it will be it needs equally to polarizing. Be like understood, but they did that just so that they could attempt to negotiate with the outside world because they recognize it's ugly. And anyway, here we are. All right. Let's grab, try and grab a couple good ones. There was one that I really wanted to get. And uh, where did it go? Hmm. All right, well, I'll just read this one. Uh, DTY LMW says, Tim, I'm begging you, please bring in a real historian that can push back to all this nonsense this clown is talking about. As a starting point, please read and learn about the whole history from the book, The Palestinian Delusion. They can't all be praising you for being a good journalist. Some of them have to be criticisms, but... So I'm a, Well, it's either real or fraud. Yeah. All right. A B says, "Oh, did, I, did it just jump on me?" It did just jump. Yeah. I hate when YouTube does that. Yeah, it's frustrating, man. Right there. Uh, it's right there. Oh, there you go. He says, uh, "A B says, Ian, you do know that Sidney Blumenthal is Max Blumenthal's father, right?" Is he? Well, that's why you brought it up. No, I don't know. <laughs> Are you guys related? Yeah, he's my father. Oh, well, so what's up? What you just talking crap about Hillary? Like they're tight. Well, I don't. Ag I don't agree, and I speak for myself. And you don't agree I with your dad, or you don't agree that Hillary? I don't agree. With I Hillary would be nervous. Clinton, I was formally denounced by the by Hillary Clinton in 2016. You can look that up. I was denounced by Hillary. I was also denounced by the Trump campaign. I'm, I think I'm oh, the wow. only person to be denounced by both. You got so a Max's company, under there? Osprey. What's they? They were basically like, <laughs> let's when we take Libya, let's make sure our Man, company. Man, I gets can't set up. speak to any of that, but the, all I know is there is no com company and no money that I know of, and uh, I. But I honestly, I can't speak. For somebody else i'm speaking for myself here i don't agree and like i think hillary clinton is a dangerous figure i made that decision i spoke out in 2016 jake sullivan who's the nsc director for Scum. joe Bi biden right now he authored the statement denouncing me on her behalf wow uh, and it was because she wanted pro-israel money from her largest donor who is named haim saban and you know I my, think fa he, my father's a complex figure. He helped start alternative media in the early 70s. Uh, his columns on the Iraq war are like vicious denunciations of the neocons. And in some senses, yeah, that work has inspired me, but I don't agree with him on other things. And I think a lot of people watching this don't agree with their parents right. on politics. So I just, uh, my, I, I just, I'm just here to do my own work. And to be judged on that. I would love to have Max in here because I've talked crap about you mean, him before. You mean Sydney? Uh, he's Max. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, Sid, <laughs> Max I'd love to have your dad in here if he ever wants to and talk about it. And well, we don't talk got, about Osprey. He's got his uh, fifth book on Abraham Lincoln coming out, so hmm. I'll invite him. Oh, cool. Oh, oh yeah, dude. Because, I mean, war is the way of the world. I understand this now. Back, I didn't, before it was like warmongers are evil, stop. But now I understand the power and the, the value of force. Oh, Ian's full on an interventionist. Just the other day, he was talking about mil he's for intervention now. He's literally trying I to mean, make a state I'm not, in the Middle I'm willing. East. There are you <laughs> a times, state in the Middle East. There are East. times and places when horrific things so we're, can we're be a, deterred with force. <clears throat> but I, I would love to have a debate with someone that's been there and worked behind the scenes. I think that, that, that you know we we should find uh, 
maybe prominent academic countervailing views and have a larger conversation. You know, God, that's awesome. But again, I, I don't think this question for Max just because you're related. I wouldn't, you know. Well, I mean, if we yeah. want, if we want to have your dad, I will ask your dad. We don't ask you about it. You know what I mean? I'll put forward a request. Happy to do that. Well, yeah, that'd be great. Whatever. You well, know, he's, like he's not really in the game anymore. But uh, but yeah, I, uh, I my work speaks for itself. That's all I gotta say. I mean, the fact that you that you are that close to Hillary Clinton and are critical. I mean, that's kudos to that. I mean, we disagree on a lot of stuff, but kudos. Well, to I that. don't give a let's, shit. Let's, let's, I met to. her once in my life. Uh, Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Let's, uh, we'll pull up the, uh, one more, we'll do one more. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. asks, Tim, any word on the 2A documentary? Man, that thing was supposed to be out for the 4th of July. Yeah. And then uh, we really wanted to include in certain footage, which we have to get clearances on for copyright issues. And so I suppose... It's just been delayed due to that. Yep. But it's fine. I don't. I don't think it's a big deal actually. As we're getting into a um, into the election season and all that stuff, yeah, it might be out. more uh, um, I don't know, prescient or yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, more opportune to to wait a little bit on it. And uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So uh, other than that, smash the like button, subscribe to this channel. And how about this? We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk deeper on all of this stuff in the members only uncensored show, which will be up in a couple minutes. So go to timcast.com, click join us, become a member. We are going to have that uncensored show on the front page of the website. And if you join the discord server, you can submit questions and potentially call in to talk to us and ask us questions. You can follow the show at timcast IRL. You can follow me personally at timcast. Max, do you want to shout anything out? Thegrayzone.com. And uh, check us out on YouTube. Just look up The Gray Zone. We, we stream every week, usually Fridays. Uh, we'll do another stream on Friday. And I work with some incredible people there. Um, you should follow them all. Um, right on. We just do straight up investigative journalism. And we break the media blockade on all of these issues of war and peace, propaganda, intelligence, everything else. Sounds good. I am Phil That Remains on Twix. I am Phil That Remains official on Instagram. The band is all that remains. You can follow us on Apple Music, Spotify, uh, Pandora, YouTube, Amazon Music, you know, the internet. And I'm Ian Crossland. I'm very serious about considering offering the Palestinian country to become a state in the United States. <laughs> I this cannot... is the most hilarious and one. It's I've not my idea. My friend right. said it last night and I, I like balked at him and I shut off the computer and I was sitting there and then it started to all kind of form. And I was thinking of like Hawaii is so beautiful. You know that they don't want it, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> I do know that. I do know that. They're, it's like it's like a less worse of either that well, or do well, they want the carpet bombs? Let's, like let's, what let's, do they want? Let's talk about the members. Yeah. Show. Okay. Sorry. Bye guys. Uh, yeah, this has been interesting. Um, I am surge.com. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to the members on the show, especially to have this be broken down by you, Max, and more so. I think a lot of people don't understand it, don't know many of the like underlying issues behind this. Anyways, uh, we'll see about that state hitting in, I guess. That's an interesting all take. Right. We'll see you all over at timcast.com in a couple minutes. Thanks for hanging out.